All right. Hey, everyone. How's it going? Welcome to Know Your Gear QA Live 170. And uh, seems like it just goes by fast, doesn't it? <laughs> As always, if you're new to this live show, keep a, a couple things to know. If you want to ask me a question, start with a question mark first. Also, if you want to start a subject or have me uh, notice that you're talking about subject, question mark first, so I know it's directed towards me. If you're watching the rebroadcast, I timestamp and index everything so you can go right to it when you're going uh, through the, uh, I think it's the comments, not the comments, the description down below, below the video. Also, another thing that's important to notice or know is that it's also on as a podcast. You can listen to this as a podcast and other podcasts that I do on uh, iTunes, uh, iHeartRadio, uh, Spotify, you name it. Links down below in the description, as you can imagine. How was everyone's week? Mine was super busy. <laughs> super understatement of the day. I ended every day in and just wiped out form uh, or quit. <laughs> you, ever, you, ever, you ever do that? One of the things you get to do when you work for yourself is you get to at to a point where you're just like, I am done. I'm not working anymore today. The, that's the good news. When you're your own boss, you can quit whenever you want. The bad news is because you're your own boss, you tend to work yourself way past when everyone else would have quit already. <laughs> so uh, there you go. There's my complaint for the week. Other than that, it was a good week. A um, couple things we're going to talk about today for sure, besides what you guys want to talk about, uh, is, uh, of course, we're going to talk about the NAM because that's already coming up already in the feed. And, of course, it came up all this week. We're also going to talk about um, Fender's something going on with Fender and the American professional stuff. We'll talk about that. And of course, we're going to talk about, because uh, I'm getting a lot of emails of the, what's going on with Phil McKnight and selling all his gear? Because uh, if you haven't noticed, I put a link down below in the description to my reverb shop. Uh, so basically what had happened was over the last week or two, I had been taking, I have a two-story house. It's not a big house, uh, but it's a two-story house. And um I've been taking all the stuff that I'm ready to part with for a ton of different reasons. There's all kinds of reasons for this downstairs and in, in, in putting a pile uh, in the front room for my wife. And my wife has been so graciously selling it. Uh, and uh, yes, it, it looks uh, it looks like, yeah, especially if you saw. Unfortunately, we didn't start until last Sunday. I felt bad because I should have mentioned it last Friday because the first wave of stuff sold like in 24 hours, which was shocking. And uh, and then uh, now we're on the second wave. So check that stuff out if there's anything you're interested in. Uh, also keep in mind, please, if you're a patron, uh, patrons get a special deal. So please uh, send a communication through Reverb like you have been doing a bunch of patrons bought some gear this week. Please put that it, uh, that you're a patron because I already have a pre-set deal with patrons on this stuff. Um, and speaking of which, I sold one of my uh, one of my favorite guitars uh, to a patron. Uh, Unfreaking believable bought my um, my Framus, uh, the purple Framus, I actually sold it. Uh, you know, that one's been on the fence for a long time. I really like that guitar, but uh, like I said, I bought myself something for my birthday, which I'll be doing a video about. This guitar is very special, very expensive, and it was time to shed off some stuff to do that. Also, keep in mind, there's a couple other things, and I'll get over this. Uh, there's a couple of things that I'm selling, and I just want you guys to be aware, of, and there's notes, I think, in the reverb auctions that state what's going on, which is there's a couple items that are really cool that I really, really like. And uh, in the videos I did, I talked about how much I like them. I'm actually getting the new versions. So there's different versions of certain stuff, and I'm, I just don't want both versions. So there you go. Uh, Brian, Brian says, hey, hey, wife, sell this pile of my gear, said no one ever except for Phil. Uh, yeah, you know what it is. Uh, I like to have, and I think I've said this before, um, I, I, uh, you guys saw my new amp rack in my closet right here. Uh, it has, uh, I think it's, it's like the Brady Bunch. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten sl slots, spaces, shelves. And then in my other room, I have two amps that I keep in there now. So that's how many 
cabinets, amps, heads, everything I want is just to fit there. So, uh, in fact, this new background, I talked about this. This is what wh why I said this has been in the works. This new background, what I did is what's behind me. I think in shot right now, I, you guys would have to count for me. I think it's 22 guitars. So in this office, I've packed in 22 guitars, plus in front of me is three, and then over to my left is two. So there's 27 guitars in here. That's a lot of damn guitars. And um, I have a uh, couple other hanging spots uh, in my bedroom and in the hallways. So long story short, I started going back to, and you guys would have to be old school viewers to remember or know what this means, and I'm not gonna cue you in, so somebody's gonna have to cue in the comments. I've been going back to laundry baskets again, and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and as you guys know, uh, the, the long-term long viewers know that's my wife's, uh, that just is when she gets upset. <laughs> So I started, uh, I realized like I have to, I have to shed this stuff off uh, and that's what's happening. So there you go. That's the excitement. I just want to clarify on that. It was funny. I guess there was like all kinds of talk on the internet, not like a big deal, but little segments talking about what's going on with him. And I'm like, and at first it was like, I don't understand. And then I looked and I go, oh yeah, I guess optically it's a lot of stuff because there's pedals and stuff like that. Um, and a couple pieces, uh, I'll have to admit, I sold, somebody actually put on a video, uh, they were shocked that I sold my Les Paul, the Chevron Les Paul. And uh, believe it or not, I love that Les Paul. It's still probably the best sounding Les Pauls I've ever heard, probably in my life, but pretty much, if not the best, one of the best. And it's amazing. But I honestly, I swear by this, uh, my Les Paul light right here that I'm pointing at with my hand uh, that you guys saw, there's a Les Paul light video. I'll index it. When I index this, I'll put a link to that video. Uh, that's it for me, man. I have my other gold top and I'll have that, but this is it. This is what I love. This is what I play. It's getting all the play time. Uh, so it just didn't make sense to have anything else. It, it's, it's, that's basically what come down to it. Also, another side thing is I've learned that I used to say I'm a Strat guy. Like I like Strats. What I've learned is I like my Strat and I'm really not a Strat guy. I think I'm a Tele guy because I find I play all the Tellys all the time, but I only play one or two of the Strats. So there you go. Let's talk about this. What else? Do, we got some super chats. Those are pinned, guys. Uh, and let's see what you guys want to talk about. And anybody wants to. Brian says the Nags. Phil has this for sale. Sweet. That Nags is sweet. That Nags was, like I said, that was the one I bought to do that video uh, to check it out. And and um, I like that Nags a lot. I will tell you why I'm selling that Nags so you guys know. That Nags is being sold because it's got the eight and a half inch radius fretboard. And like the John Muir Silver Sky that I have, I'm not selling the Silver Sky, <laughs> has the seven and a half or seven and a quarter, seven and a quarter. Uh, they're really round. And I think if you're into that, I like that Nags plays beautiful. It sounds beautiful. It, it's definitely got this uh, cool vibe to it, but it's just not going to get played over my Mira. Uh, and that's really what it comes down to. So. Uh, again, yeah, that one was, uh, I was a little shocked that I put one that I, like I said, I just took stuff down and I said, okay, this is the stuff I'm thinking about. And, uh, plus ah, there's, I can't leak anything that's coming cause I got some exciting stuff, but I got some exciting stuff coming. Some stuff that's going to be like really specific, not like a company sending me stuff or anything like that. This is stuff I'm working on that I'm excited about. So this is all a precursor to that. So uh, unfreaking believable said, thank you for selling it to me. No, man. Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, and like I said, I'm, I'm happy it went to a good home. Cause like I said that he, we're talking about the Framus. that Framus is awesome. And to be honest with you, I was, I was, I decided I'm only keeping one Framus, and I wasn't sure I was teeter, teeter, teetering, teetering, <laughs> teetering back and forth. And I don't think I can move. I can't, it's, I can't move enough out of the way for you guys to see it, but that's the Framus hollow body is what I kept. All right. Uh, Okay, we probably want to talk about some other stuff besides the stuff I'm selling. Let's see. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe maybe I'm wrong. Uh, <laughs> Unfreaking Believable also says 115 in Phoenix today. You know what it is? It might be humid too. I feel like it's musty <laughs> or something. Something's up. But yes, you can feel it. You can always tell when it's that hot. So you guys uh, outside of Arizona and these kind of places that we live like this, um, when we say 110, 118, of course, we're talking about Fahrenheit. Um, like I said, 115, I, I'm guessing would be like 42 or 41 Celsius, um, deg degree Celsius. Uh, but my point is, um, what's my point? My point is, is that believe it or not, as hot as it is, people are like, oh, I can't live in that. What happens is when you live here, when you break 110, 
it gets really hot. That's hot. But when you start getting the 115, that's why he's mentioning it. What really happens is you realize like even your air conditioning, in your house, everything is just working as hard as it can to maintain a cool environment. So you can, you get, you know, I mean, it's, it's pretty creepy to be up that high. It's hot. It's hot. Uh, my pool, so you know, is unswimmable right now. That's right. It's unswimmable. Uh, what that? What does that mean? Uh, it means that literally it's too hot. It's too hot to swim in my pool. I have a deep pool. It has a diving board. So, uh, but in my pool right now, I'd have to go check. But last I checked was a day ago, or and it was 96 degrees in the pool Fahrenheit. And my pool has shades. There's like shades over it <laughs> that cover the pool. That cover like probably 40 percent, maybe 50 percent of the pool during the day. It's not. It's not getting sun on the pool. And I have an aerator. This is just a fun story because I know people that don't live in Arizona are always shocked to hear stuff like this. I have an aerator. If you don't know what that is, it's like a sprinkler built in the pool and it shoots at night. You shoot water over the pool. It's the own pool. It's this put the pool water. It shoots it out and then sprays it over the pool. And then the air goes across the water in the air and cools the water down. And that cools the temperature of the pool. And even then it's 96. <laughs> So I'm 98 degrees. So it's like if I want to get in water that's two degrees cooler, I, I guess I'm cooling down. I don't know. It, it really takes the fun out of swimming. This is a, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, Wendell says 116 Fahrenheit with 10% humidity sounds awful. It's not fun. <laughs> we call it reverse winter here for you, uh, for you folks that live in other states or countries where you have snow and you get snowed in. We're get we call it like reverse winter. We just no one goes outside during the summer here. It's just really hot and you stay inside your house and you look at the beautiful sun outside and you don't go outside. <laughs> uh, yeah, E.R. Webster says 96 isn't a pool. That's a hot tub. Good segue since I see E.R. Webster's. I'll, I'll timestamp it. I saw his new update video. I will link you to that for the great build off. Uh, he's putting out some great videos. Uh, please check him out. Guys like me have not put out any videos. I did the unboxing. I filmed that. I'm kind of like I said, I'm stuck. I'm stuck where I'm at. So I don't know how to put out any content. I thought about putting out the uh, a video just talking about the, uh, the components I'm using and stuff. But I kind of feel afraid to share <laughs> right the reason is is because i think if i if i share what bridge and pickups i'm using you guys will know what the theme is i have a theme on mine so i'm excited about uh let's see uh plus i don't want to spend too much time doing videos because aside from everything else i'm really uh, gonna be skirting the deadline of uh really closely it's gonna be a disaster to get everything done in time again with the heat now and stuff Okay, um, let's see. Hold on a second. Hold on a second real quick. Now we're all talking about the, the heat. I, I guess the heat takes over a conversation again. <laughs> okay, so before we go to Super Chat, let's look at some of, I don't know why I can't see the first chats of the day. Um, but I'll, I can't see them now. So, all right, so we're going to go to some Super Chats. Let me flip over to a screen that is right here. Refresh it, take a drink of water. And again, uh, if no one brings up the NAM thing, we're gonna talk about that and uh, and other stuff too. Christopher Spears says, uh, I have I have bigger hands. He has big paws, everybody. And it says, uh, I always play modern guitars. I find my hands get uncomfortable. Do you think a guitar with a fatter neck would be more comfortable, i.e. a Les Paul standard? So what I can tell you, Christopher, is there's a way to test whether or not you should have a bigger neck. And it has nothing to do with the paw size. Like I said, um, some players have small hands and play big necks. Some players have uh, big hands and play small necks. Um, but generally speaking, it depends on how you your style playing. And so one of the things I, I, I kind of reference to, let me grab my... My Les Paul right here. And uh, I'm going to show you the C chord right here. And again, if I can angle that on the camera. Whoa, what, figure that out. Okay, here you go. You can't see it because I don't have the right angle. But I'm going to do it just so you see. What I want to show you is when you make a C chord or maybe a G chord, okay, some players come at it, and this is again for straight. 
Some of you guys, when you make chords, your fingers go straight across the fretboard. Some, like me, when you play a chord, I actually bend. See how I'm bending my fingers? And my fingers are hooking, what I call hooking. So it's going, I go over the neck, and then I hook over. So fingers like this are hooking, okay? So I hook down, okay? And maybe, maybe like that's better. There's a good way to show you. So some players go straight. I know for the podcast, just listen, everybody, <laughs> on the podcast, you won't be able to see this. Uh, you, some player, p players play their chords, and their fingers are kind of coming at a straight angle, angle. So they come straight like this, playing a chord. It will look like this, almost like I'm barring off. Players like me come over and see how I'm bending, almost see how I'm coming over, and then just bending straight down. So, oops, just hitting things. So why is that important? It's important because sometimes when you say uh, your hands get uncomfortable, it could be that that position, the awkwardness of kind of squeezing your fingers in between the strings. So there's something you have to do, unfortunately, and it's not as easy as get a bigger neck. It might be the string spacing that you're having issues with. So you want to start paying attention to string spacing. There's two Two, well, there's a bunch of kinds, but there's two major ones you want to pay attention to. And so you want to figure out what string spacing your current guitar has because a bigger neck will change some things. But in my experience, the bigger necks really change how your thumb positions and how your hand squeezes, right? And the reason a bigger neck is sometimes uncomfortable to some players is this. And again, I'm going to be using some stuff, but I'll be describing it to those who listen. I'm using this little toolkit. I want you guys to picture in your in your heads right now that I have this toolkit and I'm squeezing on, okay? Okay? I can squeeze really hard. If I turn it sideways, which now it's twice as thick, and get the Stumac logo. Look, Stumac, hey, look, Stumac's getting free advertising. So <laughs> so, <laughs> so here's what it is. Flat, I squeeze really hard, okay? I, I could crush this thing if I wanted to. I go long ways, so they get their advertising again. <laughs> and if I squeeze, I can't squeeze as hard. It's a little bigger, right? And of course, this way, if I turn sideways and I try to squeeze like this, I have even less strength, okay? So believe it or not, the thickness of a neck really changes how hard you can squeeze down. So because obviously the wider your thumb separates from your fingers like this, the harder it is to squeeze, just like kind of grabbing a basketball versus grabbing a tennis ball. Not every player has this issue. Right now, some players are like, no, no, I don't have that problem at all. Thicker necks is easier for me to play. It's true. It depends on how hard you squeeze. Some players squeeze really hard. Some squeeze not at all. So you have to kind of take into consideration two factors. The thickness of the neck will determine the squeeze part. In other words, if you squeeze really hard, maybe a thicker neck is going to make that worse. If you don't squeeze really hard, it will probably not change anything. So good, good, good for you. But when you're making chords, string spacing to me has been more relative to comfort than how big or thick the neck is. And when you said Les Paul standard 50s neck, that's a neck that's just, just thicker. It's not wider than the 60s I just picked up. Uh, so like I said, factor in that. A good way to get some education on string spacing is go to warmoth.com or Kiesel Guitars, but I would go to Warmoth and look at their different string spacings and some of their information and it'll kind of enlighten you. And, uh, and what's great is I have a friend and he's got, I mean, he's got paws, right? I got a, I got a pretty big hand, <laughs> right? I'm six foot, it's a pretty big hand. Um, but he has hands where like, they're, they're li like literally just mammoth hands and, the, and his sausage fingers, it's crazy. And uh, what ended up fixing his problem was he had to go to bigger, uh, wider string spacers. I don't, I don't want to say wide, uh, bigger, I want to say wider, wider string spacing. In fact, what happened was, because he was really into strats and tellies, we just ordered him some custom Warmoth necks with the wider spacing. And uh, they have a special neck they make that will fit in the neck pocket of a Strat or Tele and have that wider spacing and that way you don't have to kind of go down and fetch that because it is hard to find what manufacturers do that. But if you have big hands, think about that. So think about those two things. I hope that kind of helps. Um, and then before I go to the next thing, I like to now look to see if you guys are making any comments on that subject so we can kind of get that out. Uh, I'm not old. I'm vintage. Says I feel like a thin neck makes me squeeze harder. Yeah, that would be the that is the that would be the math, right? So technically, like I said, a thinner neck would allow you to squeeze harder, right? So the bigger the neck, the harder. That's what I'm trying to say. The harder it is 
to squeeze because the more you open your hand, um, you know, you're, the more you open your hand, the less strength you will have, generally speaking, um, when you're squeezing. So, um, which is why I've talked about this before on the podcast, which is why a lot of players have problems when they start playing guitar later in life. And, uh, this is why, uh, this is a great thing. Great thing to think. I, I know I have a video on this somewhere. I have 600 and something videos. There's a video on this and it talks about this exact same thing, but, uh, there's something that I always remind older players when they start playing guitar. So older meaning thirties, uh, if you're still twenties, maybe you still got a shot at still being the same as your, as your teens, but really once you hit your thirties and above, you're an older player. In other words, when you're starting to play guitar, you're going to have to learn a little differently, think a little differently. It's going to come at you a different way. Your brain has changed, right? Um, I think officially for men, I think they say it changes at what, 20 something years old, 22, 25, 25 or 26. But here's what you have to understand. If you're 30 years old, you have spent 30 years on the planet and your brain has filed, as I like to put it, is in a file system in your brain, it has filed certain pieces of information so that it can come up rapidly and you don't have to think about it. And one of them is your fist is stronger than your hand. In other words, if you go to hit somebody, you don't smack them like this, you punch them, right? Um, I'm not advocating violence anyways. <laughs> I'm just saying that's what you do if you were gonna do that. Uh, your hand is stronger with a fist and you punch with your fist. So your brain has determined very easily that your hand is stronger closed. In fact, if you go to pick something up, think about when you pick something up, you don't spread your fingers like, like a globe trotter over a basketball and just pick this up. You, most people, when they grab something like my phone right here, you grab, and if you notice, you're going to notice your fingers are all closed in on each other for strength. Okay. So that's the problem. The problem is the guitar players don't have hand strength, as I've always mentioned. I, th I feel like I'm telling, I'm yelling. <laughs> Anyways, guitar players don't have hand strength. We have finger strength. So when you go to make chords in your 30s or 40s, 50s, 60s, and you start out, what happens is the reason why your chords are all mashed up and weird, more so than a kid's, although kids do this too, is that your brain is like, hey, I'm trying to push down on this fretboard on these strings, and your brain goes, aha, he will have more strength, or she, if we just get those fingers together. Well, the problem is we need the fingers separate to, so they don't get on top of each other when we make those chords. Like I said, I have a video, I'll index it. So my point is, uh, you have to work on finger strength, finger exercises, which is why you have to do scales and kind of think, do, do stuff that helps your brain understand that things are different now. And uh, so, so yeah, to, to go to, I'm not old, I'm vintage, uh, the thin neck, technically you would squeeze harder because again, you're bringing your hand in closer, which gives it a little bit more power and uh, maybe separate those fingers a little easier when you're doing that as well. So there you go. Good, good topic. All right, let's go to the next one. So Grumpy Mike says he's never had any problems squeezing. <laughs> That's good. Although I will tell you, if you uh, if you uh, have arthritis uh, or are starting are prone to get arthritis, like if it runs in your family, uh, you'll start noticing that's going to be a problem. Um, you know, uh, uh, mechanics. Anybody who works with heavy heavy equipment. Uh, get all kinds of issues with their hands like that, you know, so, so yeah, that's, and so basically this is where that, that, what I'm talking about, that logic really helps, uh, if you're starting to experience those problems to think like that way. Uh, <laughs> Michael, Cru I'm going to say Cruz. Michael Cruz says, I used to do push ups on my fingertips at basketball camp. Luckily I still have finger dexterity. Yeah. You know what? That's some, that's some manly stuff. Maybe it's some womanly stuff too. I bet you women can do it probably even better than men, but still pretty, pretty badass. <laughs> uh, you know, I did a lot of push-ups in the army. I never, I never was good at it. <laughs> good enough to pass. Always, I always, you know, did what I was supposed to, but I never could do the knuckle things. You know, how the guys would do knuckle push-ups. Never could do any trick, cool push-up stuff. You know, just never, never my thing. So, uh, there you go. So yeah, fingertips would be crazy to watch. Okay, um, let's do another super chat. Let's do it. We got it right here. We got some penned. Let's uh, let's find who's next. As as it's rethinking. Here it is. It is 
It's like a grab bag. We have Jason. Jason says, what do you think of Fender Special Edition Telecaster FMTHH? The FET is a flame maple top humbucker humbucker Telecaster, uh, the Fender Special Edition. Uh, so uh, I like that guitar. The, uh, the new ones are made in Indonesia, right? The old ones were made in Korea. And so essentially they're like a Schecter uh, shaped like a Fender. Um, I used to have the FMTH h strat when they used to make that it used to make a strat and a telly i don't know if the strat just didn't sell well or it was probably because that strat the body was a little small and the neck was a little thin it really didn't feel as stratty or like a fender strat it felt something different it was cool but it was different where the telly feels that uh, really cool that way that's a great telly um without a doubt so uh what's my uh what do i think of it i like it i like it a lot it's really cool i wish it came in different colors right it doesn't come only in like two colors now red and like amber or black Nothing wrong with those colors, but I think those are the same colors since like 2006 or 2005. It's like, come on, man. <laughs> Change up the colors every couple of years, you know, especially like, what is that? Just t tell the factory that's building overseas, like, hey, do blue, now do sunburst. So that's my only, Jason, that's my own negative is the color selection was really kind of limited. They used to have, you know what it is, I'll tell you, I used to have one of them and I regret selling. It was made in Korea, Telecaster FMT, but I don't know if they called it FMT because FMT because it was a spalted maple telly. It was beautiful. And every time I played that guitar, somebody, especially non-guitar players, told me how amazing the guitar was and how it looked so expensive and so beautiful. And uh, I loved the way it played. It had Seymour Duncan's in it. And, uh, you know, just went away, it went away, just floats away. Guitars to me just float away. They, they, you play them all the time and then all of a sudden you look back and for some reason they're not getting in the rotation anymore. They're not getting played. Uh, Casey Strange just did a super chat for no reason. I appreciate you, buddy. Thank you for adding to the tip jar. And then he did a super chat again and now he's got a question. So it says, hey, Phil, I just bought an Ivan as Jim Jr. What's your take on them? What's the big difference between the gym and the gym junior, the actual gym? Okay, so a um, couple things. Obviously, the the gym, the actual gym is going to be made in Japan versus Indonesia. That's that's not a huge thing, but it's there because uh, Japan's noted for having more quality uh, manufacturing than Indonesia. Although those lines are getting skewed very much so because uh, last couple in, uh, last couple guitars that I bought, they were both Japanese and Indonesian. I like the Indonesian better. Um, the, uh, the pickups are not the DiMaggio pickups that come in the gym. Uh, there's some details missing. In other words, they, like they don't carry the vine, I think, all the way down. Maybe they do now. But the main thing is, and I, I'm just going to kind of touch on this because they're both the same as far as I'm concerned, um, which will probably offend some players out there. I have an actual gym, and I have it for collector ability. I have the floral gym. I have it because it's a collector's piece. Um, but what I will tell you is when I played the Jim Juniors and the Jims, the only thing I notice is the neck shapes are different and the neck shapes on the Jim Juniors are very good, a little thicker, a little bit more comfortable, but not accurate to a real gym if that's something that you're fixated on. So in other words, if you've, you know, that's where I think a lot of players are going to get caught up. If you've played gyms and you're like, okay, I want a gym, but I don't want to spend the cash and you get a gym junior, I think you're going to be like, oh, but the neck doesn't feel the same as a gym. Like you, if you got the gym junior and you never picked up the gym, you're not going to notice anything. And you might actually notice that you like the Jim Jr. neck better. I did. <laughs> so uh, Jim Jr., I'll tell you why. In fact, here's another thing, because I want to double down on this. I want to tell you why I don't own a Jim Jr., uh, being a Vi fan. And that's a very reasonable price guitar to buy. Uh, I'm afraid if I buy one, the first thing I'll do is upgrade the pickups and then upgrade, start upgrading things. And then I'm like going to be into it for, you know, $1,000, $2,000. When I'm done, well, maybe fifteen hundred dollars. You get the idea. So I've been staying away from them. But I would be uh, remiss if I didn't say I've, every time I see the pink Jim Junior, I'm like, man, that's just a great guitar. And they'll probably stop making them, and then they'll go up in value because that's what they always do. Jims are ne seem to never be worth much until they stop making one. Once they stop making, it's like every even the ones no one wants. <laughs> I think that's where Petrucci and Music Man learned the, their marketing platform of coming out with a new Petrucci every 60 seconds or 60 minutes or whatever they do. It's actually every, once or twice a year. But you get the idea. I think they learned over the years with Jim, uh, with Steve I, that they learned uh, exactly that. Steve I comes out with a different Jim like every couple of years, and every single one of them are not a hit. So some of them are flops. In fact, some of the biggest flops I remember now are holding some of the highest you know, uh, uh, resale values, because again, it seems like nobody wants it until you can't get it. 
Uh, okay, the convert. Hey, convert, how's it going? Haven't seen you. Oh, well, maybe I saw you last week. <laughs> it feels like it's been a week or two. Uh, it says, hey, Phil, players don't seem to collect amps like guitars. Okay, I'm going to keep reading the... I already have the answer for that, but I'm going to keep reading. My first thought is that there's a handful of distinct amp types, but I can have five tellies and one of six without that thought. Uh, thoughts. Thanks. Yeah, it's easy. Real estate, buddy. It's just real estate. Think about this. Okay. Okay. So let's, let's put this in perspective. Okay. I have 20 guitars behind me. That's a lot of guitars. If I had 20 cars, I would be on my way to becoming Jay Leno. But more importantly, I sure as hell wouldn't have like a normal house in a normal neighborhood like me. I would have to have some kind of crazy warehouse thing, right? So it becomes an it becomes a real physical issue of real estate. It's why everyone has crap tons of pedals. That's why pedals, I, I believe the reason the pedal boom happened was two reasons. One, they take no real estate. So you can buy 10 of them. And when you go to buy your 11th, you're not thinking, what am I going to do with all this? You know, there's no room, <laughs> right? Um, and, and, and physically think about this. I refuse, I refuse to get a storage uh, facility or uh, it's just my personal thing. Some of you guys have them. I'm not judging anyone. Please don't judge me and we'll all be friends, right? So uh, what I'm saying is I refuse to store guitars, amps, or pedals, even though I know deep down, okay, because I have friends. And the reason that comes up is because my friends tell me, don't sell your stuff, Phil, because they know some of the stuff I'm selling. I, I'm not dumb. The Les Paul I just sold, I got good money for it. It'll be worth more in a couple more years, okay? Everything that I'm selling right now, a lot of that stuff, it's going to be worth more if I just wait. I know that. I'm just sick of tripping over it. I only have so much room and I'm not going to devote more room to this. So amps are definitely a real estate thing. It's why people get heads now. Somebody asked me before once why I had more heads and combos and I'm like, it's real estate. I could have one cabinet and a couple heads and now I have them racked into a closet. So it's definitely a real estate issue. Even for rock stars, that's a, that's a thing that has nothing to do with your, whether you're a collector or you're a professional or what have you. Uh, even studios <laughs> only have so much room. So it's a, definitely a room thing. And that's why, like I said, back to the, the pedal boom, I think the pedal boutique pedal boom took off for two factors. One, you have almost unlimited room, okay? I keep like an insane amount of pedals in these roller plastic drawer things underneath my bed. I mean, it's nuts. I, I couldn't imagine if I had the equivalent of that storage capability for amps. I would, it would probably be out of control. The other thing is, uh, even the most expensive pedals, and I don't mean crazy, like, you know, thousand dollar weird pedals and stuff. I'm talking about the average Joe boutique pedal, about 200, $300. Although that's a lot of money, comparatively speaking, people impulse buy in that price range. And some of you guys are going to be like, what? But I'm going to tell you a little tidbit. I try to give you guys as much information on this channel as much as I can, especially about the market. What I can tell you on YouTube is the sweet spot for a purchase is $200, which means if I do a video of a YouTube channel, does a video of a product around $200, you will see an insane amount of that product sell as soon as the video goes up because the average player this is a uh this is a for some people it's a hobby for some people it's a job there's all kinds of reasons why you're watching here right now but more importantly this is a luxury uh item you know musical instruments are luxury items this is not like you know we're not here like mechanics talking about you know how we need a new drill to, to fix stuff or our socket wrenches so what i'm saying is is the uh, that's the sweet spot, so you know. Um, and we know that because, uh, well, one, I know that because a lot of us channels talk and we see that happening with the uh, links and we see that stuff with companies tell us information. Plus, um, generally speaking, there was a reason why the pedal boom happened. All the pedals were about $200 and that's where people want to spend. That's why Harley Benton is killing it right now because, again, they're in that $200 range. $200 for a lot of people is a comfort zone purchase. And that's something I, I kind of always try to remind people all the time. People talk about this stuff like there seems to be this equation in a lot of people's head and, and it could be right. I'm just telling you my life experiences in this part, in this industry so far have not, not pointed me towards this answer. What happens, what I've learned is people buy their comfort has nothing to do with their actual ability. So I know people, they make 800,000 a year and they won't spend more than $600 for a guitar. They just don't, right? They just don't think a guitar should be cost more than 600 bucks. I know people who make 20,000 a year and they own a $5,000 guitar. Why? Because they saved up for it and that's what they wanted and they're comfortable with it. That's the thing, you have to be comfortable with it. 
it it's there's a psychological part to this uh and again that's what happens when i you know i sold guitars to people for 12 years you kind of learn there's common commonality in us and one of the commonality is no matter how much money you make no matter what you're buying there seems to be this has to incite joy in you and it's the second it's in, inciting frustration and fear <laughs> It's not a fun experience anymore. No one, you know what I mean? No one wants to literally own something they're afraid of, right? What's the saying? There's a saying, right? It's like if, you know, some own your stuff, don't let your stuff own you kind of logic. Um, so I'm just giving you some of the psychology of that. And the reason I'm apprehensive when I talk like this is I want you to know this stuff, but I also know the comments get a little aggressive because there's always somebody out there who's like, you know, they have an emotional attachment to money. Like, in other words, they get emotional about the money. Don't be emotional in your anger about it. Just understand that's how that's how the market's bearing right now. Uh, yeah, ER Webster, great point. Uh, it says once I get over a thousand dollars, I start to expect more than reasonable. Uh, uh, wait, I, I start to expect more than I is reasonable from an instrument. Okay, I know what you're saying. Let me drink water. What he's saying is exactly that. That uh, I, I, you know what perfectly said uh, ER is what he's saying. There is a, a, a point where if and this is why when I say comfort zone, this is why this is important to explain when I'm talking about how it changes your mindset. People get if you buy out of your comfort zone, the first thing that happens. OK, let me and I'm going to talk to you like a seller. OK, someone who sold people stuff. What happens when I know you're buying out of your comfort zone? What I know is going to happen is not only you're going to probably return it, but also you're also going to drive me crazy. OK. Um, a lot of people that watch this channel are store owners and, of course, employees at stores and stuff because the guitar community. And they're right now, I promise you, they're nodding. They're like, yeah, I know. It's a hard thing. They can't say it, right? Because right? when I was in the store, I wouldn't say it to anybody. But now I, I'm not selling guitars. I'll tell you some of that logic. When you sell somebody, you know for a fact. It's not that they can't afford it. It's that, that it's out of their comfort zone. And you can tell sometimes, sometimes. <laughs> you know what's going to happen is exactly what ER said. They're going to nitpick that guitar. I do it too. I'm guilty of it. You guys have seen it in videos. Whenever I'm spending out of my comfort zone on a product, right? I do the same thing. Instead of, you know, when you grade a Harley Benton, it's easy. It's like 160 bucks. You're like, ah, it's got a little glue on the fret ends. It's like, hey, you know, and there's a little blurb there. And it's like, yeah, I'll just fix that, right? Why? Because you're, you're like, what do you expect? <laughs> Right. Um, and th but happens what happens is then you buy that same style guitar and that guitar is like a good example is just pick three Strat style guitars, a, a, a Harley Benton, a Fender made in Mexico and a Sir. And I bet you those three guitars, it's not that it's good, better, best. Right. It's you would literally if you bought them have a different expectation of each instrument. So you, if you got a Harley Benton for 160 bucks and it had a couple things wrong with it, you would be happy, play it, enjoy it, and go on your merry way. If you got a Sir that looked like a Harley Benton, you'd be so mad, you'd probably call Sir John Sir directly just to scream at him, right? Even though it's acceptable, obviously, because people play it, <laughs> right? So again, those expectations do change, and ER is right, it, and that's why I say you got to watch this. And that's why when I say I have a comfort zone on guitars, that's what I mean. It's because I've had people when I say like, I don't like to spend more than $2,500 on a guitar. And I mean that as a, on my higher end. And somebody will say, well, Phil, why don't you sell three of those guitars? I'm like, yeah, it's not that. It's I expect so much <laughs> that I can't be happy anymore. Right. Um, and uh, and so, you know, th th like I said, and, and then I'm not having fun. So, you know what I mean? You want to have fun. This has got to be fun. This is, this is literally for, I think, a lot of us, hopefully, uh, uh, playing music. I mean, buying gear is fun. It's, it's, you know, it's part of it. But playing music, it's, it's, I'm so happy that I get to incorporate some of my life as a job, so to speak, in doing this as, as a living for, you know, the musical part, you know. But to be honest with you, if I didn't, if I was still working in, in the corporate world and doing that, just being able to walk away and play music and do music is just a great thing mental separation from the world. It's, it's fantastic. So I want that to be joy. I don't want to be staying up all night wondering, should I, should I have, should I have paid that? <laughs> so, um, or I'll, I'll tell you what I do, which is why sometimes when I'm purging gear out, you'll see why, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to bed and I going, do I have enough money for my kid's college? I think I'm good, but I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Do I really need to, 
two strats shouldn't wouldn't couldn't one of those be books <laughs> that's what you do so it's, i remember I'm a, I'm a i'm a i'm a dad i gotta think like a dad uh uh, <laughs> uh let's see uh, i'm just laughing uh somebody said better better to get rid of a wife than a guitar you know, the joke I used to say was a weird question. Uh, you know, people always ask me questions on this, on this obviously, this show. Uh, and then they'll ask me, like, what question has no one ever asked me? You know what's funny is no one ever asked me uh, what was the strangest questions I ever got at the store. Maybe we should do a, a video. I always talk about I won't, I won't shun a, a, a customer that I ever had. I won't, I won't make fun of them. So usually if you ever hear me talking about customer on the show, I promise you uh, they're probably watching and they're a friend. Okay, because I became friends with so many of my customers. Some of them are just, you know, we're still connected. And I don't mind that, you know, they know. I know what they're comfortable with me saying, especially if I'm not saying their name and stuff. Uh, but uh, so there's uh, one, one of my favorite things that ties into what you're saying about the wife. Uh, I used to have this horrible dad joke that I used to like to say in the store. It was horrible. I didn't know at the time it was a dad joke. The, the later, my kids explained to me it's a dad joke. Somebody will be like, so, so here's the weird question you get if you own a store. Every day, <laughs> people come in your store and go, what's the most expensive guitar in here? <laughs> and it's a weird question because you know they're curious, but you're also thinking like, why are they curious? Because that's the one they're gonna grab when they run out the door or are they here to buy the most expensive guitar? On, like, I'm just here to buy the most expensive thing you have. It's always a weird question. So, and, and no matter what, I found is, uh, and I used to play over the years because you could play. You could be like, oh, it's a cu custom shop fender it's thirty six hundred dollars or it's a you know it's a blah blah, blah for four thousand dollars and i found no matter what number you picked they weren't impressed right so i noticed like you could just start saying crazy things like uh what's the most expensive guitar in here i'm like oh we have a, a shenanigan guitar it's like twenty eight thousand like oh eh, sorry <laughs> and i'd be like oh not impressed okay so anyways um but my dad joke was uh so he was like what's the most expensive guitar in here and i'm like the one that gets you divorced <laughs> It's a bad joke, but I said it all the time. I still say it to this day. What's the most expensive? When people go, what's the most expensive guitar you have? I don't know. Probably the one that's going to get me divorced. So there you go. All right. <laughs> we need to jump off that subject. Uh, let's see. Let me go. Uh, I'm looking for question marks first. I'm trying not to dip back into the uh, super chats. Hold on. Okay, so good. Guitar Hack. Thank you, Guitar Hack. Uh, he brought up a subject I wanted to talk about. Works out great for me. Thank you. Says, hey, Phil, any thoughts on Fender discontinuing tele professionals? So American professional uh, instruments, there is some information being just sent out that basically Fender has discontinued. And they're pu publicly stating in some degree that they're not discontinuing all of the models, but most of the models. And uh, here's my thoughts on that. Great. I'm glad you asked me my thoughts, Guitar Hack, because <laughs> I'm going to... I'm going to give them to you. <laughs> it's, it's like, it's like funny. Cause I was gonna, you know, anyways, um, here's my thoughts. Uh, the concern I have whenever Fender has, and I'm not saying this is the case, but in history, every time Fender discontinues a series of American instruments and comes out with a new series, whether that be the, uh, you know, the, um, uh, the obviously the American standard to the American professional, but more importantly, the, the deluxe American deluxe to the American elite to the American elite to the American ultra, it comes with a price increase. So that's what I don't, uh, I'm not excited about. Uh, that means there's a kind of again, I can't say that means there's a price increase, it means that there's a statistical, um, percentage of probability, <laughs> right? Statistical probability that there's going to be a price increase. So what are my thoughts? Ah, oh, man, Jesus, no price increases, please. I feel like those, look, We uh, anyone who's paying attention to this industry knows right now that we've had some record sales in guitars in the last two months. A lot of that has to do with COVID. Uh, you can't take the kids to Disney, so you're trapped. You're, you're stuck in the house. You're buying a guitar. People are learning guitar, so cheap guitar sales are selling great because people are learning guitar. It's great. Online lessons have been selling like hotcakes, so you're seeing a lot of the online uh, lesson channels on YouTube just raking in the cash, and good good for them. They deserve it. They make good content, and, and uh, good for them. And uh, and so uh, you're, you're seeing that. Higher-end sales are definitely pinging because, again, people got some stimulus checks, and the stimulus checks, again, I try not to be political, but everybody's not dumb. We 
we know that, you know, the stimulus checks are kind of a strange thing and the idea that they're there to stimulate the economy, which is good, but also, you know, people who got them, some people had to pay rent with them and some people just get to like wipe their ass with them. That's just how it works. That's just the, the law of, I don't know what that's a law of. That's the law of just life, okay? So the truth is some people just got a stimulus check and literally just bought a guitar with it or put a down payment on a guitar or something else. Um, and that's good because, again, it helps the economy. It's all good for the economy. I'm not 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 negative at any of this, please. Don't don't construe it that way. What I'm just saying is, is that, uh, you know, that's just I want you to be aware because I'm aware that I have an audience that some are in those both situations. So I'm trying to be understanding of both situations. But, but... What I'm trying to say is, is that uh, high-end guitars are selling. Obviously, a lot of ma manufacturers have been shut down for a few months, and so there's a lot of backlog. In other words, there's a really seems like a high demand and a low amount of supply right now, but I don't know, and I don't know if the industry even knows if that's because the demand is so much higher or it's just the demand was picked up maybe 5%, 10%, and supply dropped 5%, 10%, and it's just causing that. But what sucks is is the last thing I, I think that we want to see is inflation and I think that's what the uh, the fender thing is going to represent so again I could be wrong and again I, I'm happy to be wrong especially in situations like this I hope that you know when the new American whatever fenders come out they're like oh they're they're less or the same and you get more with them right it's really cool so <laughs> so uh so you get the idea. So, um, so that's my thoughts on that. If you guys didn't know anything about that, but like I said, I just, like I said, if I was a dealer right now, I would be expecting that. I'd be expecting that the next round of instruments are going to go up. That would be my anticipation. So yeah, Ricky says a lot of guitars are out of stock right now. It, it, you know what? It's nuts when you go online and look at Sweetwater and American Musical Supply and look at online sales are literally just uh, yeah, dude, I don't know. I don't even understand uh, how it's how it's uh, everybody's continuing because it's like like you said, it's like, I feel like it's 60 percent out of stock. And I think that's being very nice um, stuff out of stock. So. Don says, hey, why not I just talk about it. Don says he got his clothes dryer uh, died uh, last week and he got his uh, the week he got a stimulus check. So, yeah, that's that's. That's how that goes. I think I told you, Don, or I didn't tell Don, but I told the audience once, I said, when I, I once, uh, when I bought my gem off my friend, I went to pay him for it and he wouldn't let me pay him because he said, if I gave him the money, he's like, I don't know what I want to buy right now. And if you give me the money, they're like, the refrigerator is going to go out and I'm going to have to buy a new fridge. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, that's how that works. Evan says COVID guitars. Yeah, I mean, we right. It's definitely a lockdown situation. I mean, there's no other explanation for the fact that, I mean, obviously online sales going up makes sense because basically brick and mortar has been uh, tortured and tormented and, and, and destroyed and put in every horrible position you could possibly put a, a poor damn business in 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 and um and is and, and like i said that's what's good because a lot of them are selling online um you know i just bought a like i said my birthday i promised i got a video coming i just i promised i would give it to the patrons first but I, to explain the logic there's a lot to go on with this new guitar that i got for my birthday but the guitar i got for my birthday um i could have just reached out to the company that I, you know, the companies, you know, guitar companies, because I've, I've reviewed guitars for them in the past and stuff, but I bought it, uh, bought it from a dealer and I bought it from a mom and pop. So, so there you go. All right. Um, there you go. Hold on. I'm not old and vintage, said stimulus. Let me. Uh, let me help someone sell their silver sky. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's 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 good. It's like I said, it's money moving and that's part of it too. But again, it's uh, it, there's a lot of factors. But, you know, I, I just don't know. I don't know how much I believe whatever's happening right now is staying, okay? And that's not a prediction of the economy. We're not talking about recessions. We're not talking about anything. We're talking about the fact that literally it's really easy for the industry to get, you know, what's the saying? There's a saying like everybody's a genius in a bull market. Like I, you know, I, I think a lot of companies are going to be like, man, we're selling so much stuff. We can't even keep up. Let's just make even more stuff and raise the prices. And I'm like, yeah, I don't know if I would start making bad decisions, <laughs> or, you know, like that right now. Right. I would say every day is a different day until like, I, I think I said this when we first started in March on the live shows and we, and this all started with COVID. I said every day, 
you have to take it day by day because we're all in a world right now that no one understands. At least I don't. And if you do, please send me an email on what it's, what's really going on because I don't think any of us know. Okay. Uh, what else? Super chats. Let's get a super chat. Uh, we got Ben. Ben says, our lower end special run Gibsons looking at the 2016 Naked SG worth it or save the money for a higher end standard Gibson. Hope you like leather. Man, thank you for that. That's awesome. Hope you like leather. Uh, ben, I can only tell you that answer with a great story of torture that happens to me every day on YouTube. Three-ish years ago, maybe four years ago, when my store, when my stand, my store, when my channel first started, I did a video called "What Guitar Would I Buy for Five Hundred Dollars," in which I went to a Sam Ash and bought exactly what you're talking about. I bought a used Gibson Special Run guitar that was one of those satin finish uh, gold tops with P90s, very inexpensive guitar. At the time, that guitar had a value of $500 used. It sold brand new for $699. <laughs> and I bought it in that video for $400. Three years later, now that guitar is worth $1,000, which I sold for $900. Because, <laughs> of course, once, once I double my money, I'm like, well, I bought the guitar to make the video. I, I like it, but I don't need it. I'm doubling my money. So I doubled my money. And it had nothing to do with my video, by the way. That's just how the market works for guitars like that. Now, the 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 bane of my existence is about, I won't say every day, that's unfair, but that video has like, I don't know, 1.8 million views. Like every two days, I get a comment. This is a fake video. There's no freaking way he could have bought a $400 Gibson. It's a plant. And I'm like, oh man, just look at the damn date. If you have any freaking brain, you know, it was like, that's what they were going for then. <laughs> Why would we plant a guitar? And the big deal in the video is that we we got it for like $150 less than normal. <laughs> we were excited about that in the video. Now it seems like a great deal. If you're not paying attention, you're like, how did he get a $900 guitar for 400 bucks? Well, because when I bought it, if you go back and look, that's what they were going for. So the answer to your question is, yeah, dude, yeah, it's gonna a 2016 SG naked. What's this, it's gonna it's gonna go up in value. So that's Gibsons and Fenders, American guitars. There's only two arguments in play right now. There's the argument that they'll continue to go up in value. The only counter argument is that at some point, boomers and maybe Gen Xers will, as they get older, stop buying this crap, and the millennials and whoever the next generation won't care. That's all true. However, either A, you'll sell it and make money in 10 years, or you'll die and it's someone else's problem. So don't worry about it. It's the best thing about dying. You don't have to worry about selling your guitars. Somebody else will deal with that. Uh, Grumpy Mike Guitar says, uh, someday I may sell some gear. Okay, for now, I'm technically a hoarder and why not cheers? Yeah, you know, I don't, uh, hoarding, I, I, hoarding and collecting are a strange thing. I need to watch, and this is probably my confusion, I need to seriously watch some of those hoarder shows. They're on Netflix, I have it. I have never seen one in particular. I might have seen one years ago, like maybe some guy was hoarding newspapers or something. I don't know what, you know. So I look at hoarding, when I see hoarders, mostly what I see is like in movies, they always have a movie or a show and there's a hoarder in there. Um, and don't they hoard everything? I don't know if hoarding is collecting and collecting is hoarding. I'm not sure. But uh, but if that's the case, if they are one and the same, and I could be misunderstanding that stuff, that's fine. Um, that's why it doesn't matter. Either way, it's like I said, I, I have a comfortable number of instruments I like having for whatever reason. Okay, I keep two or three for sentimental reasons, like my Dana Scoop. I don't know where it's at. Oh, it's behind me. There it is. The red guitar behind me. That guitar, I say I'll never sell it. I'll never sell it. If I sell that, it's it's definitely, it's going to be strange just because it doesn't hold a lot of value. It's worth maybe $500. Um, and uh, that's what I think I paid for it. <laughs> right? So, I mean, it's it's fine. But it's, um, it's not something I play. I don't own that guitar because I play it. I own that guitar because I've had it forever and it has a sentimental... Uh, connection to me so there you go so yeah but i understand uh, and the other thing too is i think uh, uh, again i don't want to get into this part of it but um 
Yeah, Greg says hoarding is a compulsion. And it's, again, that's kind of my understanding. That's the difference, right? Like, I can tell you guys right now, uh, no joke, every single thing I own, every piece of gear, a guitar amp I own, uh, I would sell it. I have no, 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 there's no like, I will never sell that. Now, there's things I don't want to sell, okay? So like, for instance, my Solar guitar, I don't want to sell it. Old England gave it to me. It kind of, every time I play it and see it, it reminds me of that time. That was kind of cool. And it was a big deal for me because, uh, here's why it was a big deal for me. It was one of those, for me, for me, and some of you guys that are, have smaller channels or channels as well uh, that are watching right now, maybe you'll relate to this. Um, it was for me, I went to buy it and then uh, Ola England gave it to me. It was not like, hey, Ola uh, gave me this gift and now we're friends. Uh, you know, that's not really what I'm saying. For me, it was like a, I guess the quintessential moment on my channel where I realized maybe the channel is doing something because why would this entity that's pretty big in the, in the, in the community, uh, on YouTube, uh, he valued, you know, I, look, I'm not dumb. He was like, look, I could sell you this guitar, but if, if you just play it and show it in your videos, you know, people will see it and they, they might buy one too. So in other words, he, that he saw that maybe the channel had influence as they call us influencers sometimes. And I thought, it, so it basically was a compliment. That guitar to me, every time I see it, that solar guitar, that's a compliment. I look at that guitar and I go, that's someone, not like a guitar company who just wants to sell guitars, okay? And they don't know what they're doing and they're sending out guitars to YouTubers hoping they sell stuff. And that's smart, it's good marketing, but that's not what this is. Ola knows who, who's, you know, who's who on the market. And so I took it as, hey, that was a compliment. Uh, so, uh, but like I said, uh, what I, I, I say, I'll never sell it, but no, if somebody offered me stupid money for that, I'd sell it. Are you kidding? I got kids. I got bills and kids like every other normal person on the planet, everything in here. <laughs> I, I don't have it up for sale, but if you throw a stupid number, I'll take it. <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, Hold on. Okay, I got some super chats. This is gonna go long again if I don't get on, on top of some super chats, guys. I'm sorry. Uh, let's see. Um, we have Street Song says, uh, "Can I wire some four wire humbuckers to a two wire setup? Uh, got a bunch of Wilkinson parts and a bolt on neck. Uh, Epi, good parts to start my journey uh, of tweaking. Absolutely, it's great, great parts. And absolutely, sure, of course, four wire pickups are pretty, pretty standard." Um, yeah, you can absolutely, uh, four wire pickups, think of them, uh, street songs. I want you to think of a four wire, which is technically five wire. All four wires are five because you got two grounds. Um, uh, all four wire pickups are options. That's it. You can make them two wires. In fact, uh, half my guitars, when I wire in pickups and they're four wires, I'm just put them in two wires because I don't like the coil split that much. If coil splits there, I use it sometimes, but it's not really my whole thing. So yeah, absolutely. Pretty easy. You're just going to tie off two wires and either, uh, put some shrink tubing on them. You can use some, um, you can use some, uh, um, uh, electrical tape, you know, just whatever it is. You seal them off. Very, very straightforward. So, um, John says, I have a Katana 50, a THR 10X, and now a Spark. Uh, one has to go. Which one? Ah, uh, you know, that's a great question. I don't know. Uh, I, I don't have a THR 10, so I can't really speak to that. But what I can tell you is this. I have a Katana 50, and I have a Spark, and my Katana 50 is uh, downstairs right now. It's going, <laughs> right? Uh, I bought the Katana in January and, uh, it's a great amp. If you have a Katana and you like it, I can see all the reasons why you like it. I liked it too. The spark, it's not so much, I don't want to get into the better sounding thing. That's an objective thing. So, uh, generally speaking though, I can tell you a lot of my friends came over, like the spark more than the Katana, but, but that's not the reason why I'm keeping the spark over the Katana. I'm keeping the spark because like probably the THR 10, I like the, it's right here on a desk. I can use it as interface. I can play. It's just, it's a more convenient product for me and it's smaller and lighter and just, I like it. So, but that would be my answer. Although I have, I have to really compare it to the THR 10 to know, to know the difference, to know if that, that's one I would, you know, contend with. Uh, let's see. Uh, oh, oddly weird. Hey, look at that. Phonetically great. Hey, Phil, I have an Ibanez GART 60. And I am looking to maybe buy a PRS SE245. My question is, is that 
is this really two companies versions of the same guitar yeah <laughs> the 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 se245 will have a, a slightly thicker chunkier neck and um i think uh with those two guitars i think i like the prs a little bit more than the ibanez of the two but this is where it becomes a yeah if i was in the store and i played both I would predict I'd probably like the PRS SE245 a little bit more because that's one of my favorite SEs. Um, but if I had the Ibanez GART60, would I pay, sell it, take the hit, and then go pay to get the 240? No. No. Um, I guess the best answer to your question is, are you upgrading? And you're not really upgrading. You're side grading, as we like to say. You're right. You're going sideways. There's nothing wrong with that, but that's a side grade. So it's got to be just because you want it, not because any kind of logical sense that says, oh, yeah, this is what you'll get for better quality, better this, better everything. So, again, they're they're pretty equivalent to each other. Uh, Music Therapy Laz says, what are your thoughts about compound necks and fretboards like 9.5 to 14 on uh, my 60th anniversary Strat? Uh, I have some guitars with compound radius. Uh, I think it's a cool feature, and it's nothing that I've ever sought out uh, particularly. So, in other words, uh, there's no guitars that I I, I make. Man, I, I wish I, you know my guitars had uh, compound radius. Although from the 12 to 16 compound radius, which was what was really really common with the Jackson guitars early on, that's pretty cool. But I've always thought the nine and a half to 14 is like the sweet spot compound radius right and the reason is is because you can't tell man it's really really good uh my my copper strat my main strat is a 12 inch radius i love 12 inch radius if i had a choice well see i said i wouldn't choose compound radius but i guess if i had a choice i would have done nine and a half to 14. when i had my copper strat made at 12 inch radius that was super super exciting i don't know why i'm quoting cook i'm super exciting i don't know it was super exciting because fender didn't really offer a whole lot of guitars with 12 inch radius at that time when i bought that guitar custom from fender the only two production guitars i think came in 12 inch radius it was the eric johnson and the kenny wayne shepherd had 12 inch radius fretboards on the guitars there might have been one other two others but that was mainly it and um uh, they didn't do compound radius that was uh, that was something a fender didn't even offer it didn't exist so um that's so yeah i would have picked it then if i am sure but when i say i wouldn't pick it i wouldn't now you know get rid of my 12 inch radius fretboard to get a compound radius even though i like the nine the nine and a half to 14. big wave dave that's awesome that should be a shirt man you should have if i have if, if, if <laughs> big wave my name was dave i would change it to big wave dave <laughs> big wave dave sounds like a dude you want to invite to your party you don't even know why just because that way you could tell everybody at the party, like, hey, Big Wave Dave's out 15 minutes. He'll be here. People who don't even know Big Wave Dave would be like, oh, man, I, I love that guy. So <laughs> anyways, Big Wave Dave says, uh, hey, man, uh, you have heard. Have you heard anything about the Electro Harmonics 50 watt amp? Uh, well, yeah, the the Electro Harmonics 50 watt amp that I'm thinking of is the one that's really the Sovtec amp. Sovtec is owned by Electro Harmonics and they've rebranded it the Sovtech amps to be electro harmonics. I could be totally off base, but I know that's a thing that is true. Um, I played the electro harmonics uh, 50 watt amp. What I can tell you is the Tone King bought one. <laughs> and then when he bought one, I said, why did you buy one? And he's like, I don't know. And then uh, he sold it. So I asked him what he thought and he said it was okay. Uh, I remember the Sovtech ones. I know uh, Josh Scott from JHS Pedals likes the Sovtech amps. Um, and so I, the Sovtech amps I played in the past were pretty cool. The electro harmonics is supposed to be the same thing, basically. So, uh, so that's what I've heard about it. I, ha <laughs> I know Josh Scott likes his, apparently. I know the Tone King did not like his, apparently. Um, and I have never really played one. Uh, every time I was at the NAMM show, it was so freaking loud that they were like, you want to plug in? I'm like, what, um, what, what for? I couldn't hear it. <laughs> it's just, you know, I'd be cranking it up. Uh, Okay, uh, Rasha, Rasha 07 says, uh, he's got a great question. I already know. I can see it. Th I, I love it. I love it already. Already? Says, thin skin guitars, gimmick, question mark. How much more would it be? How much would, wait, how much more would not be a deal for one? Okay, hold on. How much more? I know what he typed. I know we're typing on cell phone stuff. Says, how much more would it be? 
uh, up for a deal for one. I don't know what the second part we're getting at, but I know what the th first part is. So the thin skin guitars, is that a gimmick? Okay. I like this, uh, th like this, and I, I, I'm going to be a broken record here, but I'm going to say it, okay? I, I like this theory. I'm going to keep pushing it until it's a thing. <laughs> Here's what it is. I believe everything matters, period. So tone wood matters, uh, and, and please wait to the end of this before you start typing your comments of hate. Okay, I believe tone wood matters. I believe tuning keys, the weight, how much a tuning key weighs matters. I believe uh, the gear, gear ratio of a tuning key could matter. Uh, the nut material of a guitar matters. The neck material, uh, the fret material, um, how thick the body is, how much mass the guitar has, how heavy it is, uh, the temperature inside the room. I like to get a little extreme with this. Uh, how hot it is, how cold it is outside. That all matters to the tone of an instrument. Um, the finish on the guitar, the paint. I once saw Billy Corgan said, hey, white guitars sound better to him. Um, you know, what's funny is, I want to get on a note with that, although uh, that sounds crazy, I just want to say that technically a lot of guitars that are white tend to have thicker amounts of paint on them because basically they got to primer the guitar and then paint it white because the guitar usually is tan, dark tan or brown, and that discolors the white. So they got to get coats on there. So it's I've, I've actually asked painters about this, painters at manufacturers and a friend of mine who owns a paint company. Uh, and they all said, and I didn't tell them, I didn't say what I was asking for. I just asked them this question. And they, they did say that the thickness of the paint, or the, the color of the paint uh, can, can mean that it has to be thicker. So white would have to be thicker than let's say black paint. Now, here's where I'm going to flip that whole thing I just said and say this. If you agree with me that it all matters, okay, I think then we should go ahead and say, well, how much? Okay, so here's what I think. Does tone wood matter? Yeah, but I think pickups make more of a serious amount of the sound than wood. So I'm gonna give pickups 60% would like 5%. So the question is how thick the paint on a guitar, does that matter? Yeah, but I'll say it matters because I'm not going to ever say nothing matters, but I'm going to say it's 0.00001% of the tone. Can you hear that? I don't know. Maybe you can't even hear it, right? Maybe you can hear it a little bit. I think that logic, the reason I use that is because I think that's the only logic in which musicians can communicate with each other in a logical way. So somebody says, I don't think tone would matters. Okay, well, let's change that argument from, I think tone woods like doesn't exist. Well, can't you, can't you say it's zero, you know, point zero, 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 one, whatever. Okay, give me, give me that. And then I'll argue that it's, I think it's more than that. So that's what we're basically saying. So same thing, thing. Uh, Todd Flower says, it's a sum of all, uh, yeah, all the parts. I agree. It's really like, then, then once you agree, and this goes on to what Todd Flowers is basically getting at too, then w once you agree that everything matters to some degree and we assign some kind of percentages and that's all going to be somebody's opinions and that's fine. Now we're going to argue the other things, the untangible things that matter, like, uh, yeah, seriously, how dry the wood was when it was made, the attitude of the employee that made it, you know, if they were in a good mood and they, they took extra time, you know, whether they slapped it together fast, you know what I mean? It just, there's so many things that factor it in. So back to the thin skin thing, I, is it, is it real? That's basically what he's asking me is thin skin. What he's saying is like when they go, Oh, it has a thin skin finish. Is that real? Yeah, it really sucks. Cause it <laughs> means it's going to chip. <laughs> um, but it, it's, it's to me, could you hear that? I think you would have to be some kind of uh, superhuman musician or you would have to be uh, like maybe a dog. <laughs> I don't know. I, don't, I can't hear it. Um, and the reason I say that is because I think the argument that makes sense, especially when they were making the Tonewood arguments back in the day, is a lot of times they're saying, I, I love the best, my favorite part of the argument of Tonewood is when somebody says, hey, look, the difference between mahogany and, and maple, when somebody says this is dark and this is bright, you're really hearing the pickups and you're really hearing these other things. I agree with that. I think those two woods do change things, but I don't think that you can literally change a piece of wood and then literally go, oh my goodness, it's like a totally different instrument now. There's other factors that can be changed. Um, easier. They ha There's more effect. So same thing. Uh, so there you go. Uh, huh. Hold on. Yeah, I have a question and I don't, I gotta, I gotta soak it in cause I'm not sure I understand it. John. Oh, hold on. Great. John. Great. Great point. John says, uh, he says, I, I know he's probably saying something else, but he says it matters with acoustic guitars. Absolutely. Like I said, last week, acoustic guitars are a different animal. Totally. 
I I hope I hope you guys understand that whatever I'm saying about electric guitars, uh, I'm not saying about acoustic guitars. So if, for instance, if his question was thin skin on acoustic guitars, which is not what I got from that, but it could be because you know obviously acoustic guitars do thin, thin skin finishes. Absolutely. Like I said, anything that that prevents the top from from vibrating from resonating is going to hinder the overall tone of the acoustic guitar. So yeah, so polyurethane versus lacquer. Like when people are like, lacquer sounds better. It sounds better. Um, yeah, on acoustics it does. I think it does. I think a lacquer acoustic, nitro says lacquer acoustic sounds different to me than a polyurethane. When somebody says it's on an electric guitar, it sounds different. I, I think that's like, uh, again, you're, you're, you're great. Your dog ears are working for you. Good for you. You can hear crap I can't hear. So, um, and I've said this before. I'll say this again. Uh, Paul Reed Smith, I, Paul Smith, uh, I've seen him personally when he's doing his talks about this stuff. And here's what I can tell you. And I've always said this. I don't agree with all that stuff. You're <laughs> right. And he talks about that stuff. I don't really go like when he's like, oh, you hear that? And I'm like, uh, I, I guess. But here's what I say. I think he hears it. I don't think it's as sells many as it sounds. I think he really believes it. My my take on him. And the reason is, is I, I've seen something that only probably a few of you have ever seen. I've seen how he is on a camera and then they turn the camera off. And then it's like he, he's not he's not changing. Like however he acts, whatever you're taking in on videos or in clinics, I've seen him where even people you know he don't you know he knows no one can really hear him. I've seen him just act the same way. So again, doesn't mean I agree with it, but at least I I believe in my opinion. I believe he believes it. Uh, there is. Uh, guitar hack. Now I'm gonna hit guitar hack. This is the first time because he's gonna say he says this and he and he and so you deserve this guitar hack. It says basic physics clears up tone debate real quickly. Basic psychology clears up women real quickly too, doesn't it? Oh wait, no, not at all. Hmm, that's the same problem. So the idea that I believe the idea that somebody thinks they could figure something out, I, I think that's what I'm saying is it's ever involving and there's gonna be little things. Uh, think about this until we had cameras, certain cameras, we couldn't see things. You know what I mean? So things we used to believe didn't exist until we got up cameras. So if you're going to use, and this is my whole point, if you're going to use, and I've seen this with other, other, other people too, if you're going to use science to debunk things in, in this category, you got to understand that science is going to change too. That's just how that works as we get, as we get more, uh, more information as the technology grows and stuff. So the physics and the science of it, here's where it gets problematic. It doesn't equate for everything because um, there's some anomalies out there. You know what I mean? First of all, how about this? There's, there's, uh, here's my argument. Uh, again, I like arguments, so I'm gonna give you one. Um, imagine playing one of Jimi Hendrix's straps now. I mean, they exist, right? They're on the planet Earth, a bunch of them. The ones he played at Woodstock, the ones he played, there's ones he played. Imagine picking one and playing it. Now, it's going to, it's going to have a weird feeling. It's gonna have a sound. It's gonna have, I mean, it's gonna be an emotional thing when you're touching it. And playing it and you could go oh it's all in your head it's not real but i don't know i'm gonna argue it is real because i mean it's there now you know what i mean there's there's some kind of weird thing that happens so so guitar hack again i'm not saying you're wrong i'm just saying i wanted to say that because every time it says somebody says physics proves it i always say well psychiatry proves all kinds of things too uh but that doesn't seem to work always <laughs> doesn't seem to work for me at least um And, <laughs> oh, uh, okay. Anthony says, so what you're saying, I'm just going to read it. So what you're saying is Paul Reed Smith is as annoying off camera as uh, when he's on camera. Well, here's the deal. What I'm saying is, uh, is if you think he's annoying or whatever you think of him on camera, that he is like that off camera. I've only had a couple interactions with him over the years. And, um, and I will say, like I said, he's very consistent. <laughs> um, Okay, uh, hold on, hold on. I'm just trying to find comments that still pertain to the subject, Ron. Yeah, you know, Jay Mason's saying, I bet those guitars would have a lot of little problems that only Jimmy knew how to finesse. Yeah, exactly, it's weird. Um, it's weird to me. Um, there is this. There is a mental aspect. There is a psychological aspect to this that you have to you have to understand. 
I, I don't know if all of you will be able to identify with this or are kind of identify with this, but I can tell you that a lot of you will. Okay, so not all of you. Um, I I love my Copper Strat. I play it all the time. It's my one of my main guitars. You guys hear me say this all the time. I can't really tell you that a single person has ever picked up and played it and told me they liked it. In fact, uh, just recently in the last few months, I had somebody play it and go, it's so weird. Like they go, they were like, I don't understand this. And, and it just suits me for some reason. The, the way I pick, the way I play, it's just mine, right? And that ties into what you're saying about Jimi Hendrix and the subtle issues with the guitars. That guitar is not perfect. I, so when I say it's my favorite guitar, it's not because it's perfect. It's just because there's this weirdness to it. It's, something about it appeals to me. Uh, maybe it's just the copper color. Who, who knows? Maybe it's the neck. I don't know what it is. But my point is, is that, yeah, there's a psychology to this that we definitely know that there's that's in there. And if you don't acknowledge that, and that's what I'm basically getting at, you're never going to understand music. If you know what I mean? If somebody, when somebody, think about how boring it is when somebody goes, oh, well, let me tell you the science behind this note and this note and why they work and why they don't work. And then I'm like, all right, great. Let me show you this musician who just broke all your rules and made this amazing song. You know what I mean? There's, there's, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta embrace both sides. That's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> Ho hopefully you embrace both sides. Uh, because, uh, you know, like I said, you got to understand there's a psychological a thing. I think where a lot of people get upset, though, is when manufacturers, and I'm just pigeonholing manufacturers, but companies try to use the psychology to trick us and to, you know, sell us some, some, some uh, snake oil stuff. That, I agree. I think it sucks. Um, uh, but so, you know, it, it's hard to, it's hard to, I don't want to say fault them for it because I definitely should fault them for it, but it's hard to call them on it when musicians are also guilty of it too, right? <laughs> I mean, now that we're all getting older, it's, I feel like almost every rock star from the 70s and 80s has come clean about almost every lie they ever told us about their gear, right? They're like, oh, uh, yeah, that wasn't special. I was just using a DS-1. Oh, that was just a standard Marshall. You know what I mean? So, uh, all right, let's go to the next subject. Next subject, we, and I don't think we're going to even talk about the NAMM show. So I'll just end the show with the NAMM show in the end. Uh, cause it's, uh, apparently I didn't think it was that big of a deal. Obviously. Well, you know what? We'll talk about it now real quick. So the NAMM show got canceled. Um, the, uh, a lot of you, uh, obviously, uh, you know, said, Hey, it got canceled. I actually knew last, well, it was last month. It's been over a month. Um, but I was actually, I was NDA non-disclosure agreement on that. I was told and I couldn't tell anybody, uh, so trust me, I was even tempted to like on the live show would be like, I have a prediction. It might not happen. You know what I mean? And that way I'd be like, how did he know? But I think here's the sad thing. Uh, yeah, I knew for sure a month or so ago, but it, you know, everybody thought it was, it was going to be canceled. So it's canceled. So uh, the question I got emailed to me this week, a couple of you emailed said, Hey, so I got canceled. What, what do you think that's going to mean? Um, what I think it's going to mean is, uh, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, not to the guitar community. I think it's going to have bigger ramifications to other industries. The guitar community is already the smallest uh, industry or section of the NAMM show in the first place, right? The NAMM show is a huge amount of DJ and all this other stuff. It's been overtaking for years, uh, recording DJ, all this stuff. Um, it's really affects the dealers and the, especially in Europe, they used to fly that fly over into the NAMM show to make deals and stuff. But I, here's what I think. Um, yeah. Companies will just sell to the dealers through zoom and other uh, platforms. They'll interact the same way. Um, what's great about the NAMM show is uh, it's so expensive that I can't imagine that if you have to, that you have to spend more to not be at the NAMM show communicating with dealers. So it might actually work uh, in favor for some companies. Um, the question for me on the NAMM show is whether or not this is a coffin nail in the NAMM show as a whole for the future going forward. I think, no, I think eventually the NAMM show will go. But what I'm, what I'm, what I'm predicting right now is that if the NAMM show comes back in, you know, winter NAMM 2022, it might be a smaller, it'll be in the Anaheim Convention, uh, Convention Center, but it'll be a smaller NAM because I think a less company is going to, to come. Uh, but I'm really, I think it was a good idea to close it. I think that it's not even about uh, COVID, even though, you know, that's what it's about. But I think uh, it's about the fact that you're going to probably have a low, low attendance. And that would be really, so think of this, this is what would really suck. Could you imagine if there's a NAM show with a really, really low attendance and the manufacturers are still paying huge, you know, huge amounts of monies to be there and really not getting a, a, a anything back. Um, as YouTubers go, I would imagine there's going to be a lot of YouTubers promoting a lot of product. 
Um, I can't imagine I'll be doing too much of that. I find that, uh, although I have, like I said this before, I have great relationships with a few companies that just, I like them, they like me, and it all seems to work out. Majority companies, they kind of stay away from my channel. <laughs> So uh, I laugh because I'm like, uh, you know, whatever. Uh, it's 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 like I said, and I always tell everybody so you guys know it's the onus is on me. I I'm very aware when companies reach out to me, the way I communicate with them, it's not normal. For, and, and and I've been told that by other channels who have tried to help me and said, look, um, you know, I start with all these weird rules and thoughts, and they're like, no, that's not how these companies want to talk to you. And and to me, it's like if they don't understand what I'm doing, then I don't need to work with them. Uh, is basically what I'm getting at. Um, so there you go. All right, hold on. Any thoughts on the NAM show? Anyone? Wendell says, move the NAM show to the Long Beach Convention Center. Okay, that'd be... <laughs> um, Todd says it's time to get back to work and living as normal. You know, here's the, and this is again, this is ties in uh, to what I think is going with NAM. I don't even think, NAM, again, I want to reiterate, I think the NAM closing has some to do with an anticipation of, you know, restrictions from COVID and what it's going to be like to, to, to have masks and uh, the, the temperatures and whether or not stuff. But I don't think that's at the core what the main closing was for. I think it mainly closed because they probably, probably looked and did some analytics and what they figured out was they're probably looking at probably the lowest turnout of, of, of any NAM in probably 20 years. And again, it becomes how, how long do you have to recoup? Now the NAM show would probably be fine. I don't know, but here's the thing. You do not want to be a, a mid-sized company. I mean, the big companies are always going to be fine, but you don't want to be a mid-sized small company paying 14,000 to $50,000 for a booth so that you only write, you know, two thousand dollars in tickets and sales, that would be catastrophic. You know what I mean for for a small business to experience that. Um, so, uh, yeah. And then Josh said, "What if the Nam show is scaled down?" A same issue. The issue is they need they need the scale because they need they need the mid-sized companies and the smaller companies to get, they need the numbers. Does it make sense? They need those dealers. They need those numbers to make it. And let's be clear, according to the Nam show. Okay, according to them. So I'm going off their numbers. According to NAM show, they had record attendance this year and record attendance the year before. They've been doing great the last couple of years. I know personally, uh, I'm trying, I'm thinking, hold on, give me a second so I can be as accurate as possible. I feel safe saying six. That doesn't sound like a lot, but it's six. I can think of six companies. I know personally six companies that told me not only did they not make enough at this NAM show 2020, which I thought was one of the record most exciting NAMs. I, as you guys know, after the show I came back, I said it was one of the most exciting NAMs I'd been to in probably 15 years. They didn't even make enough money to, not only did they not make enough money to pay the cost of being there, a couple of them didn't make any money, zero dollars. Uh, two of them wrote zero tickets. So four days working their ass off, tens of thousands of dollars, couldn't make one sale. So, and one company in particular, I just bring this up. I did a video for them and the video made them uh, like $15,000. You know what I mean? That's how much they made profit from the sales of, of the product. Now, I didn't charge them anything for the video. So I'm going to tell you the story. So I make a video for a company, small company. They made $15,000. That's in their pocket now. They took that $15,000. They paid for the NAM show, which was $14,000. They got zero sales. They gave all the money that I gave them away, that you guys gave them they gave it away. So could you imagine how horrible it would be if they scaled it back? <laughs> that was at full throttle, <laughs> right? So yeah, that's uh, it's, uh, it's what it is. Uh, now, here's the thing about how I feel about this. How do I feel about it? Well, you know, I, I've always been at odds with going to the AM show every year. I've, I've talked about this. I love going, but it's expensive and it's, it's an expense. Um, so to me, uh, I'll probably do, uh, I'll probably look for some way to create some other excitement for us on this channel without Nam, Maybe we can do something like that. I'm open to ideas from you guys, especially. You guys always have the best ideas. <laughs> okay, uh, where are we at? Okay, so we're pretty much at the end, but I need to clear up any of the super chats. If you guys uh, know super chats, so if you do one starting from now, um, I can't answer it. 
Um, so let me go where I left off. And we have, hold on. It's funny because it, okay. Uh, Nathaniel says, hey, I'm debating on buying a neck from Warmoth. Do you prefer roasted maple or rosewood for the neck? Any trade-offs? Uh, so I have both, and I prefer, uh, I probably prefer the roasted over the, uh, r the rosewood. The rosewood is my least favorite neck. Um, I have the blue one behind me, the blue strat behind me. I, I'm pointing at a blue strat, kind of. Um, I have two uh, rosewood necks right now. I have the red strat, which I'm selling because I don't like that one. I just never could get it to sound right. It sounds too too bright, which I think some people would like, that it has a lot of strat tone to it. This rosewood also has a little brightness to it that I don't love, but I like having a rosewood neck. It's kind of fun and exciting. But deep down, I think I prefer the roasted maple necks over the rosewood. Um, so there you go. The only logic I would give you to get roasted uh, rosewood is that, you know, obviously rosewood, uh, is, uh, more unique. You know what I mean? It's, um, you know, you don't see it as often. So there you go. Uh, trade-offs, uh, you know, there's, they're both hardwoods. They're both going to have the generally the same kind of effect of the sound. So that's what I would think about. I like lightly roasted as, in other words, I like roasted ne necks that are, don't have a heavy, dark, uh, roasting to them. Cause I feel like once they roast them too dark, they get too, uh, too bright, too hard sounding, harsh to the ears. Uh, Ishinery kid says, should I replace the bridge on my CE 24? Man, that's crazy that you say that. Cause I was playing my reclaimed CA 24 today and, um, you know, it's, uh, it's on the block, so to speak, if I'm going to get rid of it or not. And, uh, that's what I was thinking too. I'm like, maybe I should keep it. Maybe I should put a, 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 a real PRS bridge on it. Here's what I'm, I'm concerned about. Um, let me tell you my thoughts and then let's be very clear. My reasoning for putting a real PRS, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just saying it that way because it's like a core bridge on there, is I like the tremolo arm better. I really hate how thin the tremolo arm is on the C24s. It's like just too, it's too, I feel like I have nothing to hold on to. That tremolo arm is so tiny. Um, but I do like the steel uh, saddles in the steel block more than all the brass on the core one. So, and I will tell you for the price of the coin, it's crazy expensive. So it's a huge upgrade. So should you replace it? Uh, I'm not going to replace mine. That's where I came to. So it's funny. You, you talk about replacing. I was literally in literally today thinking about it and I'm not going to do it. So, uh, I'm not going to do it. I'm not saying you should or shouldn't do it. I'm just saying that's what I decided based on my logic of that. Jason says, is there a golden a six like guitar that is more affordable uh, by a different manufacturer. There is and isn't. Washburn has made some. Uh, Samick has made some. Companies make them and then stop pretty quickly. Um, the A6, though, you should be able to look at A6s used, especially now because the older A6s have rosewood versus the rich light fretboards. Again, it's uh, not a huge, you know, like, oh, the rich light sucks and rosewood's good, but it just makes it kind of cooler. And what's funny is that for some reason, what I've experienced is I don't see that people are commanding. Uh, any more money for the rosewood ones. The Golden A6, I, I'll tell you this, Jason, if it helps. If you buy a Golden A6 used for a good price, you know what I mean? Find a, a good price on one, uh, you know, whatever the average good price for a used one is, um, you'll get that out of it when you sell it. I, 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 like I said, I had a Golden A6. I loved it. I only, I got rid of it because like I said earlier today in the show, I'll get rid of anything. I had a buddy that was like, oh man, I love your guitar so much. He goes, if you ever sell it, I'll buy it. I'm like, oh, okay. And he's like, and I said, okay, so I threw a price and it was what I paid for it. And he's like, okay. And I'm like, all right. So I got what I paid into it back. So I decided like what I think about is now my money's back. And if I want to buy it again, I can. Um, I've been thinking about getting the, the classical guitar, Godin uh, A6. It's not called the A6. It's like a multi-act, but it's classical. But um, but yeah, there's a couple companies that do it. But there's another called Crafter Guitars. Look up Crafter. You can probably find their version of it for a little less money, but keep in mind the Crafter is probably going to be made in China. No big deal, but it's made in China and it's probably only about 30% less. So factor that in, right? Um, but Crafter. Uh, let's see. Uh, I, Jor Jorel, I hope I'm saying this right, man. I'm, I'm sure I'm butchering your name. Jarrell says, hey, Phil, I just bought an American professional Jaguar. Love it. But the frets look kind of kind of matte. What's the best way to polish them? Fret uh, rubbers. Yeah, you can use the fret erasers. People like those. I have a set. Um, if you don't have them, there's a lot less least expensive things to do. I use uh, two things um, I have here in one of my toolboxes. This is the um, 
Daddario fret dress kit. It's 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 not as far as I know, it's not Gorgamite, but it's like that. It's a sheet. Uh, it works really great if they're lightly uh, cr cruddy. This works great. You can buy one of these. You can buy a set of these for six dollars on Amazon or Sweetwater. So for six bucks, you can't beat this, uh, in my opinion. Uh, but uh, again, I still like buying a. Um, here you go. Uh, get yourself some good fret guards. These will pay dividends in your life. I promise you. You buy one of these sets, a set like this. You can buy a set on Stumac. You can get them. I reviewed the ones on Amazon. They're a little rough. So just, you know, you might want to take some light sand and polish them a little bit. But either way, what I will tell you is if you get one of these, they will last forever. If you get the uh, the, the sheets from Daddario, they will come with the ca cardboard fret guards. Those obviously won't last very long. Um, you can create fret guards with just painter's tape. <laughs> you know, right? You could cut a little cardboard too and like a business card and cut them out and stuff. But if you're going to do that, just use painter's tape. But I will tell you this, the best way to do frets in my opinion, is just painters tape off the, the uh, just take a strip of painters tape, put it on each side of the fret, put a couple strips over the pick guard so that none, nothing gets on the pick, uh, the pick, did I say pick guards, pickups, and then use a uh, triple aught or uh, four uh, aught uh, uh, steel wool. And uh, a lot of people don't like use steel wool, but man, it's cheap and it's easy and it works great. Just you know, you get you get little pieces on your uh, on your magnets if you don't if you don't cover them. You can put a towel over your guitar too. Again, it, it sounds like to me you just need to get them cleaned up. So that's what you can do. Those are the things I use. You can use micro mesh. You can use the fret erasers. Those work great too. But cost wise, again, it's up to you. The, 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 it's uh, obviously you have a great guitar, so investing a little bit of money to get the right tools isn't bad. Um, so, you know, just think of it that way. But but uh, I, obviously there's no downside to the other stuff I said. Uh, it, they work just as good as the other stuff. They're just a lot cheaper. I just like you to know all the options. What I've learned is I, I'll give you all four options. You choose. Uh, okay. Uh, let's see. K.R. No, not uh, Warham. Warham 5 says, I got a spark. Exclamation part. So he's excited. Uh, did you get my email? I did get a bunch of emails from you guys about the sparks literally this week. It's been just the crazy week. As you guys noticed, there was no videos this week. I did make some videos this week. Um, I was able to release one to the patrons. I always release the videos early to the patrons at first um, so that they can... My patrons are my editors. <laughs> they watch them and then they go, you spelled this wrong. Oh, that's wrong. You said this twice. You know, right? And uh, they they help me find uh, some of the things. Or uh, when I... They, they really... What they've been great at is they'll say things like, I really wish you would have said what what this this and i go okay so i can cut that in that's the best thing about having one hairstyle all the time and wearing one kind of shirt it's easy to go edit back in myself into videos <laughs> i don't i don't have to go man my hair is different today um <laughs> Although I do change shirts a lot. So the shirts are all different. So you notice in videos, if you guys ever catch that, like it's one logo, then it's a different color logo. So that's me different days uh, or editing in things that the patrons have suggested. But um, but uh, I plan to get through those emails. I just, like I said, it was just a crazy week. Just so much, so much, so much repairs this week. It was so crazy. It didn't it just so much it was just crazy all right uh and then uh snack juice <laughs> said new uh new bridge for 80s korea strat bridge on a telecopy it's a martin stinger stx i don't know what the question is though a new bridge for an 80s korea strat bridge on a telecopy that's like so many different things you're saying right there strat bridge on a telecopy Okay, so it's a telecopy, but it's got a Strat style bridge. Um, it's a Martin Stinger STX. Okay, so so you want a new bridge for that guitar. So the problem is, is I need to know what posts are on it. But what I can tell you is, I always say this. I love the Vega trim. I still use my Vega trims, and one of the things I like them in, about them is they can fit different kinds of uh, of of pole pole heights uh, or pole uh, pole widths. I'm sorry. Um, and I made the metal fist when I'm doing that. Uh, so that's one of the things you can get away with that. But you really would have to know, um, because here's what you don't want to do. You don't want to have to yank the yank the, the pole pieces out and then plug them and then, you know, because dowel them, plug them, redrill them and reset them. You can, but, you know, in today's day and age, look, all those mods that everybody does with guitars like that, that was because they didn't have the options we do. There's pretty much an option for everything. So, 
it's up to you. It's usually a cost thing, right? But it, usually if you buy a, you know, if you buy a bridge, a bridge is a bridge. So just buy the right bridge. Um, but I would recommend, I still recommend the Vega trim a lot. Uh, Mark, Mark says nothing. He just did a super chat and said, thank you. It's awesome. Uh, thank you. Um, so tip jar. Thanks. Alex says, uh, got a very special heritage 576 hollow body. Sometimes the tone on the neck pickup works and sometimes turning it does nothing. Any advice? Um, so that's interesting because, uh, let's see, you're saying you turn it and it works. And then when you turn it, sometimes you turn it, it's not working. And I'm taking that as when you turn the tone control, you're not hearing anything. And, uh, that could be cause it's shorting out. And so one of the things I would do first, again, Occam's razor, simple solution could be the easiest one, given all things being equal, go ahead and make sure that it's either not tightened too tight or it's not too loose. Uh, the nut on the tone, on the tone pot, uh, because sometimes when they get, they get too tight, they compress and then they ground out to something that's happened. Or sometimes if they're too loose, it's it, when you're turning it, it's shifting and touching something and grounding out and, and then not, uh, and then once you ground it out, it's not going to work. It's not going to, it's going to be out of the circuit, so to speak. So that's what I would check for sure. The actual idea that the potentiometer itself is acting up in that way is not likely the, uh, it's not likely that at one point it's making contact contact with it. And then at one point not. So my guess is that it's moving. It's either cause it's moving underneath there. So you need to tighten it or it's, um, it's just clamped down the holy crap. <laughs> so, uh, so like I said, you'll know if it's really tight, just loosen it just a hair. Don't make it loose, just loosen it. And if it's loose, tighten it. And then also, uh, if you have a dental mirror, if you have a mirror like this, if a little mirror, it would be a really good idea if you could, uh, stick it in the sound hole, uh, in one of the F holes of the guitar. And when you're turning it uh, on there, try to see the potentiometer, see if it's moving and, uh, try not to get it to move. So there you go. Sometimes you have to kind of work a pinky in there and hold it against the potentiometer. It's kind of a, it's kind of a bear, but it's not impossible for, for anyone to do. Uh, Sparkle Tune official says bought a Roman Magic Twanger 425 USA Flame Top Thin Line. Whoa. And then the screen just jumped. It just jumped. <laughs> okay. It says uh, Thin Line Duncan Blackouts. Uh, do you know what's the secret to them? Closest to my 69 tele I have found. Uh, do I know what the secret is to the blackouts or to the Roman magic twanger? Um, the, the Duncan blackouts to me, in my opinion, sound like how I remember 80s EMG sounding. New EMGs don't sound the same to me, the 8185 sets. They don't sound the same the, uh, as they used to. And the blackouts sound more like the old EMGs than the old e are the new EMGs. So maybe that's what it is. Um, but again, it could be just the, 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 the way the guitar is made too. Cause it's weird. Cause you're saying it's like closest to your 69 telly, but it's a blackout. It's an active pickup, but that's just proof that, you know, new pickups can sound old and old pickups can sound new. I don't know. Scott says looking for a 2016 offender American limited edition standard Telecaster with Rosewood neck for $1,200 worth it. So he's looking at that. Um, I'm going to say, okay, so I, right now I told you prices are up. Right now, 12 sounds right for the market, but I would bet you just two months ago it was a thousand bucks. Um, I paid, I think I paid 11 or a thousand, thousand ish to 11 for my red strat with the rosewood neck, which is the counterpart to that. So mine's a red 2016 strat. Um, and uh, so yours is uh, the, the Telecaster with the rosewood neck. It's probably the surf green one, I would assume. Uh, so it's the, it's the sister brother to that guitar. And so 12 seems high, but again, in current market right now, it sounds about right. So is it worth it? Uh, yeah, you know, I, I'll tell you right now, I bought the red Strat with the Rosewood neck because I wanted the surf green Telecaster with Rosewood neck, but I have another surf green Telecaster and I didn't want two surf green Telecaster and I didn't want to get rid of the one I had. So I would have bought that. I think if I would have bought that, I would have kept it. <laughs> so yeah. Worth it if you want it. It's a cool guitar for sure. It's cool. Uh, Craig says, uh, a coffee. Thanks for the one watt amp advice uh, last week. Oh, and it jumped. I got uh, I got both 
uh, the, the G10 cream back and the loop volume knob. They both work really well. Awesome to hear. I always like hearing feedback on stuff like that, guys. I appreciate it. Um, Al says, I'm tossed between an Epiphone Dot and a D'Angelico Premiere. Both sound good and the feel is good. I'm wondering about how good the uh, and lasting they are. Um, so, I mean, again, you know, things change, factories change, things change. The Epiphones in the past, the Epiphone Dots in the past were obviously held up really well and they're very good guitars. Uh, D'Angelico's uh, newer to the market for what they currently make than I think of when I think of Epiphone. Uh, but I would imagine they're on par for the quality. Probably made in the same factory. They're not, but you know what I mean. Same equivalent style type factory. So there you go. Um, to me, it's an easy answer. I like the Epiphone Dot more personally, but I think D'Angelico's got kind of, or D'Angelico, depending on how you want to say it, but D'Angelico, it's got that, uh, 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 oh, D'Angelo. You said D'Angelo. Is it D'Angelo or D'Angelico? Either way. I don't know. Either way. Um, but cool. I, like I said, I'm, I'm, I, I want an Epiphone Dot. So I'm kind of biased right there. Let's start there. John Smith says, Gibson is my favorite headless guitar brand. <laughs> Unintentionally. <laughs> Unintentionally the, the favorite uh, headless guitar brand. Uh, let's see. Pedro says, I got a Martin uh, a Triple Lot 15 after your advice. I'm loving it. How should I install the strap button that came with it? Or should I not? Uh, might want to install a pickup in it later on, so I uh, don't know if uh, that is a factor. Um, okay, so the question is, you want to install the strap buttons that came with it? I'm doing off memory. That guitar doesn't, does it have two strap buttons? Does it have, I know it has one at the base at the bottom, but does it have one? Um, if, it, if it has both, then what I would do is uh, get the correct drill bit uh, that matches up to the new screws and then install them just where the old ones are. But if you're asking me because the, there's no strap button towards the front, I don't want to give you that advice over a, over a you know podcast communication. That's something you definitely want a, a video um, because there's a couple things you have to pay attention to when you're drilling into that part of the neck, um, especially, uh, especially with the, a nicer guitars like that. Okay, you don't want to get that wrong. So what I will tell you is this. If you do need to ins install that strap button, I can't tell you because I don't know where you live and I don't know your circumstances and the environments you're in. But I mean, uh, but uh, I, I install I install strap buttons for $15 on a guitar like that. It's it's it, I have a bench fee. So it's $15 to put something on the bench. So I would tell you uh, if you were uh, local to have somebody like me do it for 15 bucks, it, it'll pay its weight in gold because again, um, I install them predetermined by the types of guitars, the types of models. Um, Jeff says, uh, did the PRS music school this week? Oh, awesome. I was hoping somebody would talk about that. Uh, it says it was awesome. They will be selling uh, replay worth it. Oh, they're going to sell the replay. Okay. Questions. Question, ever use PRS customer support? Got issues with finish. Okay, so a couple things. Yeah, um, so I, the is the repay worth it? It depends on how much they charge for it, right? I mean, I think it seems like it's worth it. I'd be interested in seeing the, the replay of it. Um, but again, it would have to be reasonable. You know what I mean? Uh, in today's day and age, uh, hopefully it's 20 bucks. I don't know. I don't know what they're going to charge for that. Um, or it depends on what they're doing the fun, the money. If they're going to, you know, feed the musicians with it and stuff, that'd be kind of cool too. Again, those are two things I'd factor in. Uh, question ever use customer peers, customer support? Uh, not since I've been a YouTube channel, uh, but yes, as a dealer and as a customer, uh, yes, in the past, but you know, now, cause I have, I have contacts through the YouTube channel, um, with their, uh, marketing person. So the marketing person usually gets, well, that's not entirely true too. I have a couple friends that work there. So I just kind of ask them sometimes, like I'll ask Nathan, I'll text him I'm like, Hey, you know, this is an issue I'm having. Um, but if you have issues with the finish, uh, talk, talk to customer ser uh, service, you understand PRS is uh, 360 something employees. Uh, I don't know how many in customer service. I, 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 it's been years since I've seen, but back in the day it was two. It was like Matt and Sean, I think. So it might just still be Matt and Sean. Um, something like that. So, uh, but you should get good service, customer service. I've had 
One viewer tell me they had a horrible experience in very detail. I got all the details about it with a, a silver sky. And I agree with them how horrible it was. And I don't know what that was. It was kind of weird. But everyone else, they always uh, send me messages saying that they had great experiences. Um, and so, like I said, all I can tell you is this, Jeff. Uh, and I tell everybody this. Um, you know, uh, contact them. Tell them, you know. You know, see if you can get your problem fixed. It, not just PRS, any company, that, especially if have you ever seen me work with any company on this channel, whether it be Ibanez or Kiesel or, uh, you know, uh, uh, Gibson or, uh, uh, you know, PRS, Fender, anybody you've seen me ever work with uh, and you have a horrible customer service experience, just email that to me as ask, ask New Year. I can't fix it. I have a couple times in the past fixed it for people. Sometimes it's simple and I can just forward an email to somebody. And sometimes, Knowing that that I might, you know, I, mean, I would never kind of thrash somebody, but, you know, they don't know that. So they might just sometimes when I send it to them, they're like, oh, and most of the time it's just because they're good people. And they just, you know, they're like they, they know if, that if they're, you're connected to me. They're like, ah, he feels a good guy. This guy must be a good guy. Maybe there's a connection that way. But what I'm going to say is sometimes I can I can help that along. But but that's I can't guarantee that. In fact, I can't even say that I can help you. But what I can do is this. If you tell me sometimes when you have the negative experiences, I it's nice to hear because I think about that. And sometimes I talk about that, as you know, when I do a review, I'll mention it. I'll say, hey, oh, this is, you know, I'll say, oh, here's a finish. And, and it also helps like if I'm doing a review and I'll be like, oh, there's a little finish here. And I heard once from a viewer, you know what I mean? Those things help get that information out. Again, it's just about giving the information out. Nobody is one guitar. What I mean, I've said this before, no, re no gu review of one guitar means all re guitars are like that or not like that. No review of one company means all experiences are like that. So, but when I do reviews, unfortunately, my videos, uh, like a lot of channels, when you do these reviews, your video is your timestamp. It's this. It's, uh, so if I have a good experience, it's like 10,000 people see a great experience. If I had a bad experience, 10,000 see a bad experience. I want the, I want the videos over time to be as accurate as possible with the experience I'm having, you know what I mean? Or we're having as a community, you know what I mean? So, so yeah, just uh, let me know. Finish issues. Look, I, I really believe this. So, you know, I really believe that PRS uh, not only has finish issues, but they knew it uh, or they know it. And that's why they've changed the nitrosos lacquer. Uh, when I did the uh, interview with uh, Jack Higginbotham, um, there was a discussion in the video that I think the patrons only saw. I took it out of the main one on the live show, but I believe it's on the podcast version. Um, and we just talk about nitrocellulose. And the only reason I didn't put it in the main version is because I got, got I got it real quick that he doesn't really deal with that and he didn't know anything. And that's what I was trying to find out was, hey, is there a reason for changing the finishes? Is there a problem with the old finishes? So we all know that the bubbling kind of happens. So you know, it, it's, it's, uh, it's, so you just have to contact them. But it's so you know, I've only had it happen to me personally on one of my PRSs and I've owned about at this point, 15 of the damn things. So personally, I'm not talking about store ones or issues with other people because I can't, unfortunately, you know, when I sold the guitar to somebody and then they came back with an issue, you know, we took care of it, but I don't know to this day if it was really the company's issue or the, you know, the person did something. Me, I know what I did and versus what the company did. And so I've only had one actually have any lifting issues. And, um, and, uh, you know, so, I mean, it's not, not good, but it's not horrible given the amount of guitars. So like I said, uh, let me know. John says, have you tried the seven, eight, nine string guitars? Have you tried out seven, eight, nine string guitars? Okay. There are a lot, uh, you can do with nine. Uh, you can't do with six, of course. Um, so Josh, I used to play for some reason for about three years, three years. I don't know, maybe it was two and a half, three years. I used to only play seven string guitars. Uh, and I had an insane collection of seven string guitars. This is unfortunately right before I started doing YouTube. Probably right up, probably changed right before I did YouTube. So when I think I started doing YouTube, I probably owned about four seven string guitars. Um, currently, I have now dwindled down to one. I have one seven string behind me. It said I've been a seven string. I just like that one. I had a Music Man Petrucci. I really, re not regret, but I kind of miss it because it was a cool guitar. But um, uh, that being said, um, I have tried sevens. I have never played a nine. I probably picked one up as a joke, you know, at the NAMM show went, look, nine. And uh, I have tried to play eight. And to be honest with you, the only eight string that I ever really could even connect with in any light way, or any, any light way was the Strandbergs. And my teacher plays mostly eight string Strandbergs. I have a video where I did talk about Strandberg and my teacher 
uh, Matt uh, Vandal, as you guys seen on the channel, he plays mostly eight string Strandberg's uh, jazz stuff on them. So um, I've tried to play that. It's just eight strings. It's not my thing, man. Seven makes sense for me, but eight just got a little wacky for me. So, um, but now I've kind of kicked back down to six again, obviously. So it's the same with bass. I used to play seven string bass. I had that forever. I had a uh, Conklin, a real Conklin, not the import version. Uh, they had an import version. I'm just telling you because it it there's different models. And then I switched from uh, a six or seven to five. And now I play all fours again. But believe it or not, I'm about to review a six string bass. So that's about to come out. Uh, Jim says, what are your favorite pedals? Um, that's an easy question because you see I'm selling pedals right now. I'm selling pedals because I've decided I only have two pedals in my life anymore. And here are the two pedals. Ready? The, the pedals I love that obviously it's apparent I love them and pedals I'm reviewing. I get to review pedals. I've been saying no to so many pedal companies for so long about doing reviews. And it's mostly because what, what pedal companies do is it's just pedals are again another co uh, commodity where there's usually a, a decent mark on them a profit because i mean they're not going to sell gazillions of pedals and make lots of money so uh 200 pedal they probably are into it for 60 70 bucks Again, stuff like that. I'm just giving you generalized numbers. But the point is, what I'm trying to say is most channels, uh, they're going to send you pedals, especially this channel, this size. They're going to send me a pedal, and, and they don't want them back, so I just get pedals. Um, and after a while, I was like, when do we do all these stupid pedals? I'm like, it's just too many pedals. And so what I decided was, I'm like, okay, I'll thin down the pedal hertz. So uh, one of my favorite pedals. I love boss pedals, and I collect. I actually collect boss pedals. Um, you guys have seen that. I have a lot of boss pedals. Not, a, not an insane amount. Maybe 50 50 boss pedals, 40, 50 boss pedals, but I collect them still. So if when I see certain ones I don't have, I still collect them. Um, I don't buy the crazy $500 used boss pedals. I just won't do that. All my most expensive boss pedals uh, that I buy used are about hundred bucks, 110 bucks. Uh, you know, I, I collect them because they're fun and they're uh, obtainable and it's fun to check them out. Uh, but my favorite pedals. So here are my favorite pedals without a doubt. I love my love pedals, my plexi, purple plexi pedals. I have uh, three of them. I love them. They're on both my boards. In fact, um, oh, my board's behind me. I was going to say, I don't have a board here. 68 Deluxe, uh, 68 Deluxe and 68 uh, from uh, uh, Lawrence Petros pedals is still my favorite. I love the 87, but I don't use it that often. It was on the board and it just came off. I find myself always going back to 68. But I think if you're ever going to try, I tell everybody this, if you're going to try a Lawrence Petros pedal, the 87 is, I think, is more likely you're going to like that over the 68. Um, and then... And then I like my 5150 pedal because I like the noise gate. It's the typical pedals, but I'm trying to think of them. And I love uh, Keeley pedals. But I'm so one of my favorite pedals. I'm gonna say my favorite pedals by brands are gonna be pretty simple. It's Keeley, it's Boss, it's Lawrence Petros Design, it's Love Pedals. Those are probably my favorite brands of pedals by far that I use the most. Um, and I'm pretty habitual on this. Uh, most of the pedals, all the, all four of those pedals, what I can tell you is I've been using all four of those brands of pedals very consistently for many years. Uh, Wes Shipman says, love the channel. Thank you, buddy. One question. Will a Fender pre-wired pickguard vintage noiseless fit in a Squire Affinity? Okay, so this uh yes and no okay so i gotta tell you the yes and no what is possible so let me tell you what the possible problems are and then you can deal with that from from there on the squire affinity line uh some of them depending on the years could be thinner than a normal fender so and the and the um the noiseless pickups are thick they're thicker than normal uh, single coil. So you could run into a problem where you go to push the pick guard in and just with the wiring and everything, it's just not, it's not deep enough. The cavity is not deep enough. It is not likely is definitely with a bullet. You'd be a problem, but not likely. So you may want to measure that. Uh, I I've done it before. I've installed good pickups like that in affinities and never had a problem. I just, again, I just want to you know, let you know that there's a one in one in a million, well, one in a hundred shot that you might have. It might be too, the cavity might not deep, be deep enough, be deep enough. Uh, other than that, here are the other problems you're going to come across that are possible. The screw holes are not going to line up. The good news is, is that they're going to cover all the old screw holes. So you're just going to have to drill new screw holes. Okay. And then if you ever take the pick guard out and put the old pick guard on, that'll hold all the new screw, that will hide all the old screw holes that you, you know, drilled in. So there's nothing wrong with drilling some new screw holes. Um, the bridge should line up and the neck should line up fine. You shouldn't have any other problems. So like I said, that's your two issues, depth. And then of course, screw holes might not line up. Now, 
the newer, the more newer your affinity, the more likely it's going to be right. Okay. Uh, Fender has actually been moving forward. They've been getting better at lining up some Squire stuff to the Fender stuff. The older your Squire is, the more chance that it's not going to line up with Fender because they used to not uh, look at that that way. Fender, Fender used to look at Squire as different and now they're trying to, you know, sync them up a little bit more. Uh, Rasha says, thank you for the feedback and for the tip jar. Oh man, thank you. I appreciate that. And then, uh, these are my last super chats. So this is it. Uh, uh, Gabriel says, Hey Phil, looking for a low wattage amp at home that will sound close to my twin custom 65. I'm playing an arch top guitar with a head rush board for effects. Thanks D dude. I, I gotta tell you, if you want a low wattage uh, amp, that's going to give you the great fender kind of twin, uh, custom sound, the clean sound, uh, definitely look at the, the blues junior or the Princeton. Those are the two. Uh, the Blues Junior will probably have the fatter sound. I mean, again, you're looking for the low wattage small amp. That that would I would look at those. Uh, they sound great, um, especially if you're trying to duplicate that amp. You can get cheaper stuff. You can get stuff that sounds good that's less money. But those two amps are great, especially you can pick them up used. Blues Junior, you should be able to pick up used for 400 bucks even in the current market. Um, so Blues Junior or the uh, Princeton. The Princeton to me has got more of that compressed kind of sound, which is nice. Um, the 68 even more so, more compressed like a basement, uh, and the uh, 65 uh, uh, Princeton is a little different. The uh, reverb on this, uh, on the, on both those amps are great. I think you'd be happy. Stick with Fender, make that easy. And again, they're relatively not crazy price, even brand new. Uh, Princeton's gonna run you uh, 900 to 1,000 bucks new, and the uh, Blues Junior can be as high as almost 700 dollars new, uh, six six range. Uh, Warren five says effects of stainless steel, stainless strings on stainless frets. Uh, you should be no, no effect whatsoever. Uh, believe it or not that it's, uh, it's okay. Like, right. I know what you're thinking. You know, you're thinking, okay, the hardest, the, the hard, the hardness of both are equal and they're not. Uh, I believe I would bet that, uh, if I was a betting man, uh, that the stainless steel frets are slightly harder than the string still. Um, <laughs> steel, uh, and, uh, but either way, either way, I've never seen any negative effects of them. Um, uh, you know, those being used together. Although I once heard a story, this is true. I once heard a story. I'm, I, it's a story. It's a story. <laughs> I once heard a story from somebody who worked at EVH and they said that when they made the first Wolfgangs with stainless steel, uh, frets and they put stainless steel strings, uh, Eddie was complaining that when he was bending, there was friction and they said, that's impossible. And he kept complaining. And so they changed the strings, uh, new strings. And then he said, okay, you fixed it. It's great now. Um, and they said, okay, that's weird. And they looked at the package and they apparently put nickel, uh, nickel wound strings on there. And they're like, that doesn't make any sense. And so they put the, took the nickel off, put stainless steel back on. And then Eddie didn't know this. And then Eddie played and he said, no, it's, it's, it's back again. Whatever you did, it's back. It's not, it's not bending correctly. It's friction. And so they called back to headquarters and they talked to their, you know, their guru of frets and stuff. And, and, and he said, I told him what happened. And he said, well, technically, I guess if steel, two stainless steel surfaces rub, there can be a gas admitted off. And then that's creating friction. This is a weird story. I'm just sharing it because it was the weirdest story I ever heard. And I heard it from the EVH guys. I don't know if just crap they were trying to start or whatever they were doing or it really happened. Who knows? But they said that's what happened. Um, I always think about that when somebody asks me that now, but I, me personally, I've never seen it before. Stainless steel strings on stainless steel frets are fine. Uh, think of this. You put nickel strings on nickel frets, they're fine. Stainless steel st strings on stainless st steel frets are fine as well. Uh, Frederick John says, what's your favorite guitar that you own? Uh, easy. My favorite guitar that I own is, without a doubt, uh, and I always say two because it's just they're on par. They're same. My PRS Mira, my, my core, my 2000, I want to say it's 2013, could be a 2012. 2012-13 Mira guitar, which is their basic PRS guitar. That's that's my love of PRS, by the way. I have their basic model that they don't make anymore. I love it. I have a backup for it because <laughs> I like it that much. I wore the frets and refretted it uh, just recently in the last like eight months. I had to refret it uh, for the first time. Uh, and that's my uh, favorite guitar. My second favorite is my Copper Strat. And when I say second favorite, I've, tell, I've told my wife this. This is a true story. I told my wife, I go, hey, if there's ever, you got to grab a guitar and run out of the house. Just grab one. I don't give which one. 
that's a good catch. Don't care which one, just grab one of those. That's my favorite guitars, uh, which I think is I think is common with a lot of players, especially if you you know you collect up all these guitars and everybody's like, what do you need those guitars for? I, I don't need any of this stuff because literally I could just play those two guitars for the rest of my life and be happy. I just love playing tellies though, and those are probably what I like to play the most when I'm not playing those guitars. Uh, but those are my that's my favorite guitars, either the Mirror or the Strat, and it's equal. It's definitely equal. If if you ask me which one's my favorite, it'd be literally whichever one's closest to me. Which is by the way, that's my trick for my kids too. Here's a tip for you fathers out there. Uh, when your kids ask you, well, Dad, which one do you love the most? I always tell them, I go, whoever's closest, that's the one I love the most. <laughs> it's true. So it works. <laughs> All right. And then the last question I'm going to answer today is from John, who says, no answer necessary. Well, that's going to be exciting. But, uh, but you cannot answer my question next week if that helps. <laughs> we're going to end on a, a, a funny note. All right. That was fun. A great way to end the show. Um, and then uh, Tito, and just because he put a comment, he says, thanks for the cool clubhouse you built and all the cool knowledge you dropped. So many useful tips I've learned uh, from you, buddy. Thank you. I, I like I said, I want to thank you guys back. I appreciate this Friday hangout. I was going to do a bonus one this week on Wednesday. I kind of, I felt bad that I didn't do it. I'm going to try and do next week, do a live bonus live show to something a little different. As always, guys, I want to thank you so much for your time and uh, have a great weekend. And uh, until uh, next Friday or maybe possibly Wednesday, but probably next Friday, uh, know your gear. Oh, let me end the stream.